are very welcome to the Overlap Rugby Podcast. I'm Shane. That's Dara. Hello. Two brothers discussing all things rugby through the lens of Leinster and Ireland. Um, yes, this is episode 124. Um, yeah, well, for those returning, welcome back. It's been a few weeks, but we figured we'd get back on it. We normally do follow the test footy, but given that there's been so much drama in the club footy scene and we're coming towards, you know, the denouement of the European season and all the other club footy kind of uh, uh, leagues are all homing into you know the business end and the play the post season's coming into view we're going to touch base anyway and uh, and do another episode to cover all of that and um, we are going to start by looking at uh, the women's six nations however because we, we missed a few weeks we're going to look back on on that and wrap it up as well as the women's tri nations tournament which was happening in the gold coast over the last few weeks we're just going to give an update on that on the international footy before we go go in full hog on the champions cup and just give a kind of a brief brief summary of what's happened in the knockout stages so far before previewing that that great final that we have a replay of last year's semi-final as Leinster take on La Rochelle in Marseille yes indeed yeah glorious uh, game to look forward to some plenty of good stuff to look back on as well it's been a thrilling uh, thrilling end to the or or tail end of the of, of the northern season with the uh, still some very climactic uh, games and weeks to come so we'll touch base on all of that we're also going to look back on the challenge on the challenge cup which is at similar rounds ahead of their all french final which will take place on the friday in marseille before the uh, before the main event mm-hmm. on the saturday we're going to take a look at the rugby europe super cup which wrapped up the black lion of georgia claiming the victory there we're also going to look back on uh, some weeks of Major League Rugby. I think they have a few weeks left for their regular season before they hit their playoffs. The Superliga in South America, yep. um, that's heading into its playoffs this week. We'll touch on that for sure as well as Super Rugby, which has obviously been going on. Um, very exciting stuff going on with the Inter, uh, Inter-Tasman games. Uh, some surprise wins, some great Aussie performances, and things are really heating up ahead of the playoffs true. and setting up for a nice Bledisloe later in the year as well. So we'll be talking about all of that. Yeah, true. We'll do our usual European rugby roundup. We'll also touch on the sevens before we wrap up with the uh, rugby news of the week as well. Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, There's some very good news this week as there well. Is. There's a lot to talk about. So yeah, we've got all, all the kind of major stories that have been going on that we've missed about Wales, Wales, uh, uh, talking about cutting a region about obviously the, the main story being the uh, the situation with Spain which is a few weeks old now but we yeah. haven't touched on it yet we'll we'll obviously, dig into all of that covering that rugby um, Europe championship and that World Cup qualifier with such vigour and we're so excited for Spain when, when they won um, but you know uh, yeah. yes we will we will discuss we'll all things dig, that in dig, that news segment towards the end indeed and uh, digging into all of that Spanish stuff there's also there's some uh, the World Cup nominations um, this uh, uh, World League that's come popping back in so many good good conversations to have in that news of the week segment at the end of the show so if you're interested in any of that uh, you can click on that we'll have a timestamp there in the description so you can head on down to that if you're interested in any of those conversations absolutely um, yes and as, as we said before for those returning welcome back uh, if, it, if you're new here uh, welcome you know this is our, our platform for doing long form rugby discussion uh, and we do love to, to kind of you know just talk about this game that we love as well so if you have any opinions on that as well or if you enjoy what we do please do like subscribe leave a comment down below ring the bell so that you know you're notified when we uh where you upload as you can tell as the regular subs know it's a bit infrequent the bell is actually quite useful for us as well so whenever we do pop up you know you'll, you'll know when we uh when we're uploading something else so yeah all of those good things but without any more ado we are going to get into the meat of the show and as we said we are going to start by looking back in time a bit and uh, discussing the women's Six Nations, which wrapped up a few weeks ago. Now um, we had that we were billing it uh, the last time we were talking on on one two on episode one two three about that big climactic game between France and England. Um, it, it was definitely a high high quality affair. It, it did round off the Super Saturday in style. Unfortunate, and even though we were apprehensive, like there was still a little bit of a mismatch there, despite France's undeniable quality. Mm. Um, there was there was still a tale of just you know one of these things is not quite like the other, and that England machine right. Right now is just looking imperious, um, imperious. Really, they they Grand Slam champions. I think it's like four Grand Slams in a row, is it or something? That's right. Obscene yeah, yeah. like that, and they don't show signs of slowing down. And with the World Cup looming, and actually the news that they're going to host the next Women's World Cup as well, it's just you know England are flying the flag for the women's game right now. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, they're a joyous team. Uh, yeah. That's the first thing you'd say um, in terms of it's rare you get a team that that drags the rest of the world around us forward a generation yeah seemingly which is what this England team are doing I mean the, a few years back we were just lamenting that the the women's game while entertaining was still amateur in nature 
um, obviously naturally given the, the the infancy of professionalism at the time yeah. um, but they've come on for for uh, being professional for only a number of yeah, a handful of years yeah. they've come on absolutely leaps and bounds some of the offensive shape they run is just beautiful everything that they're trying to do is so on point they yeah. keep improving so the I mean the kicking is good the skill sets the passing just yeah. the act the crispness of the passing because exactly. France were the, were the ones you'd associate with being more razzle dazzle in that game but it was the crispness of England's passing and their cam that was the, the night and day difference between the two sides the, as well their yeah. cam particularly yeah. you know, I mean I think actually I think uh, you know England have some real real quality players they've arguably you know you, you have a hard time arguing against them having the best player in the world in nearly every position it's in true. terms of the quality the of what they're yeah. doing but actually the number one difference I would see between them and everyone else is just how, how well coached they are yeah. just it, they're, they're, they're calm as you say in Kelsey's because they know they, they know and trust their processes so much they can yeah. always just go back to them and there were times in this tournament when the offence came unstuck when I, I like this is the scary thing is they can get better they, yeah. what they're trying to do with the ball is is on another level from every single other team and yeah. that's the real concern for everyone else because even France are playing such sort of free form jazz kind of rugby still with Sansu just trying things yeah. and, and Sansu have, credit to Sansu she did get player of the tournament as well yeah, and like I you mean, know in men's or women's game the French do know nines they know yeah. halfbacks and she's, she is great oh no but, no, uh, que- no question and they all know how to run a tracking line and and, and uh, pick off a try once the line is broken and they demonstrated that throughout the tournament but in terms of breaking down a defence what England are doing with their pod system the spacing of their backs and forwards yeah. is just on another it's level to work any right other team front row at the um, minute as well like that's, yeah. it's their monsters and their ball, their ball handling skills are so good that it is it does just set them apart they also have that conflict like four, four grand slams in a row every prospective opponent of them is going in kind of looking at a daunting task so it's very difficult to be calm in that position and you can see with France doing it and with, with the teams even on the lower level the other teams in the comp they, there's a, a feeling that you need to pull off some kind of miracle at play every time to get around them and England can capitalise on but that's that they the can just is, be calm and you, allow them to, to m- and mop up those mistakes all the you, time you do that's, yeah. the, th- that's the thing is their, their offence is probing and constantly asking questions and holding its width really well and even when they make mistakes and it's it's notable that in that France game they didn't break France down in the multi-phase or even first phase it was mall tries that actually ended up getting them on the scoreboard but that constant probing and taking along took its toll on the French where by contrast when they don't have the ball they're extremely phys- physical and extremely organised and they aren't being presented with offences anywhere near as sophisticated as their own I mean the toughest yeah. workout that England defence gets is in training on yeah. Mondays and Tuesdays when they're running against their own offensive systems in France you know their, 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 their script was flipped on them because for, for most of the tournament actually it was their defence they were leaning on they had the great offence but it was actually off turnover ball and things like that which is where they were getting their scores because their multi-phase wasn't great um, but then it, like England basically did to what they had been doing to the other teams to them in the sense that they gave them the ball France huffed and they puffed and they tried to do things with it couldn't break England down at all and then when England had the ball they were that bit better it wasn't perfect but the mall was the end that they found they edged it they gave themselves more opportunities by being a little more creative and having a bit more versatility and in the end they were comfortable when yeah. they went into the 22 they were, they were confident in getting a score they huffed and they puffed and eventually they did and when France went into the 22 France weren't getting the score they weren't breaking down that England defence yeah. and on both sides of the ball what England are doing is a lot more sophisticated it's a lot better coached the quality of coaching is, is night and day different I think it's the number one difference between England and the rest they're, they're, I mean, probably a consequence of professionalism as well but I know some of those those French girls are pros as well yeah but, but they just uh, don't they, look like the same kind of cohesive unit at all yeah and I know it's true they do look a very good team themselves and possibly even the second best team which is the worrying thing that's kind of where we're at like they did they did school the Black Ferns when they met last year um, in, in France twice so we, we know that these two this game that uh, we were building up is kind of the gold standard for women's rugby at the minute and it is England who are, who are charging yeah, away well, from I, it I mean yeah. like it, it, France it, 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 they were at home with a with a packed house and feeding off all of that energy and they played a bloody good game in, in, in many respects and ended up losing it by 12 I mean to contextualise yeah. that that achievement um, like the the other teams Scotland lost to them by 52 uh, Italy lost to them by 74 yeah. uh, Ireland lost to them by 69 Wales lost to them by 53 
France by 12. Yeah. They actually managed to contain... They were the first team to really manage to contain the England offence for large periods. But it took so much out of them, they had nothing they to respond t- with. Yeah, and they, and as, a, as a consequence, the game was, was, was just a dead game. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a heroic effort to lose to them at home with your rambunctious crowd by 12 points yeah. in a comfortable manner. In, and France, as you rightly point out, could be the second team in the world. Well, could be the only team in the world... To even get that far yeah. against this England team right now, to well, actually all hold points them. to that, I yeah, because yeah, yeah. the Black Ferns were champs and they were nowhere near that level at all as well. So yeah, like credit to England, they are flying the flag, they are bringing the sport forward. It's it's the exponential rate at which they're growing compared to the rest that would worry because that gap we do want to see narrow. But to be fair, um, like as well as England improving, there were other teams. You're right to point out there's been a lot of improvement across the board in in the other teams in this tournament as well. I thought yeah. like on the last week as well, Italy got a win over the we- the Welsh women, which was kind of good for them. It kind of hadn't fallen for Italy at all really the tournament long until the final round. Um, Ireland also got a got a narrow win over Scotland on the final day as well. And Ireland obviously were in a big rebuild phase after failing to qualify for the World Cup Scotland are in the World Cup Wales themselves are night and day different from what they were last year yeah. they're completely they'll be, they'll be they're gutted diff- by that defeat to Italy they and, and it's the, the full house of home defeats to Italy for Wales yes, in terms of under yeah, 20s true. seniors and women's um, or yes, <laughs> senior men's and women's um, that was yeah extra- extraordinary trifecta of results especially when you consider how good Wales had been but a great result for Italy who have all the skills as well I mean, as it, you're right that the quality of the game has come on leaps and bounds from even five, five or six years ago. It was so rudimentary what was being done. It was, you know, it forwards in tight around the ruck. There were no real forwards in the wings. You had your 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. It was like watching test uh, men's internationals from the 70s or 80s. Yeah. Whereas in just a few short years, even these games between Ireland and Scotland are being played to so much higher yeah, there's level. There's more shape, the there's more ambition, there's, yeah, there's, it, there's a yeah, more quality, skill. The quality, quality of the rolling mall. Yeah. The rolling mall has been a big weapon in, throughout the tournament. Yeah. And the quality of the games like, has been very dramatically brilliant. I mean, Ireland stealing that win against the Scots in the, with 84 minutes and yeah. then kicking a conversion to win it. Yeah. Very dramatic stuff, brilliant stuff, great scenes. And, and nice to know that the, uh, the Scottish women have retained the men's penchant for losing those big <laughs> those big games in the last play I mean that was a rough one for them yeah, they did, and they did likewise, the important Wales, one get themselves into the World Cup though that's, yeah, that's still the well, bragging rights <laughs> indeed Wales taking the lead against Italy with five to go conceding a penalty and losing it that way yeah, there were, plenty, they were, there were plenty of great games um, between those those other four teams below to be honest because France were at arm's length from all of those teams as well whenever mm-hmm. they met for it pretty much as well and then England were at more than that a, more, a full yeah. body's length and but more it, it, it'll drag everyone forward I mean it England are England are reinforcing the standard they look a bit Saracens-esque in terms of what they're doing they're so clinically brilliant in all areas and detached and they, they have the same sort of psychic energy that that great Saracens team had that led to that great England team from 2019 just yeah. in terms of their organisation and their temperament is just absolutely brilliant and on point but the rest of the teams are going to have to take notes the Black Ferns now know what the standard is teams like Australia know what the standard is obviously France as well and the whole game is going to drag up as a result of it so while it is it is a concern for the moment that you have this dynamic where England are so much better than everybody else and it's it's greater even than the extent to which you know that great All Blacks team of 2011 through to 2015 coming in that World Cup were great, better than everyone else. I mean, that team at least had nearly, some cracking nearly, games nearly and had to dig it out of the games, fire a you know, few times. We haven't um, seen this England team have to dig it out of the no, fire I mean, yet. But the scary thing um, is, you'd, you'd, you'd feel like if they ever met the team that would push them all the way, they would have the answer. Just, just assessing their temperament in that way, I actually do get the feeling that they would. Um, but regardless of the fact that that's not true and they don't have a true rival at the moment. Um, I still think that it just bodes so well for three, four, five, six years' time when you're going to have multiple teams playing at that level and just the general standard of, of women's rugby is going to rise from that pre-professional amateur era right up to the quality of the stuff that you're seeing in the modern men's, modern men's game with all of these kind of sophisticated ideas about defence, attack, mall, scrummaging, all being shape, implemented. Shape on shape. Yeah, and it just yeah. makes for a much better spectacle if we can have multiple teams playing like that England team. And I do think that that's what the future of the women's game holds. Yeah. Um, so it was a great six nations. It was brilliant as well for crowd attendance. Yeah. That was big. The attendances um, were up on everything. And you know what? 
it, th- this new window that they've found that's that's after the Six Nations that isn't net side by side with the with the men's Six Nations is I'm all all, all for it. Yeah. We were all for it when it when it was announced. It just it means it's not swept under the rug in 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 a weekend that has some some dramatic moments in Test footy. It means it has its own little standing in this play in in this kind of rugby calendar that they're talking about. And I'm all for it. And you can see that the attendances were great throughout. That some of the attendances in Ireland were fantastic for some of these Everyone games. Was breaking well, records. Yeah. Every single country was breaking records. Uh, it was fabulous to see. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and it's just the glass ceiling has been broke as far as engagement in women's sports. There were sexist hang-ups. I think the World Cup in soccer actually a few years back was a big moment. I think that was in France yeah. where they just got these huge attendances and people are just embracing it now because it is just as good. It is enthralling to watch. If you're an England fan right now, you yeah. want to be there to be witness this those historical because, team because yeah, they'll, they'll yeah. never be a more dominant team in women's rugby, I don't think. And yeah. I think they are red hot favourites I mean like as, oh, as big a, as big a favourite as you can make to, to go and do this World Cup I, I would just one I would one. back them 100% yeah, no, I yeah. just, 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 just don't see them losing it I think it would be very very tough to see it would have to involve the top two inches and they'd beat themselves would be the only way I can think of, of yeah. them doing it but or for, for, for France or, or the Black Ferns potentially going up two or three levels between now and then but I I, I'm, I would be sceptical about the ability would, of that I, to happen I would but they've been they've been stunning to watch they've yeah. been absolutely brilliant and congratulations and champions once again four times in a row for Grand Slam champs and good value for us this England side um, elsewhere in the uh, in women's world rugby uh, we had the women's tri-nations tournament which was an interesting it was taking place over the go- uh, the last few weeks in the Gold Coast in uh, Australia and one of the big results to come from it was actually Japan women getting a famous win over the Wallaroos they, 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 they did was, I think it was a two point win was it 12-10 tight, yeah, a two, tight game two tries each um, yeah. Japan spending the whole game defending they got one defensive breakaway try but showing some real organisation against a decent looking Wallabies uh, attack that, that was trying things trying a good few screen moves and Japan just getting the read on it making big tackles all day long defending yeah. them like demons and looking a great team and then the, the Fijiana were the third team in that uh, in that uh, group and they too were beaten by Japan who won the little competition there you go. Um, yeah. making an absolute statement ahead of the World Cup the Women's yeah. World Cup the, the, the Aussie team looking half decent as well even the Fijiana we know has some real quality and yeah. again it's just a, an insight as to the 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 a, a little bit of real quality coaching right now the state that the game is right in if you can get if you can get your coaching right and your athletes tip top and um, you can make a, a real explosion and a real leap not quite to England levels but certainly right up there to the second and third in the world levels sure. and I, I, I think Japan uh, on the evidence of that little competition would be a team to watch especially on yeah, the defence in that World Cup for um, sure yeah no watch out for it always watch out for Japan they'll be they'll be organised but then yeah as you say the Fijiana have some super athletes as well yeah, and the Fiji and Drew up like, uh, top on the super W table it's, yeah, yeah serious yeah. stuff it's, so I mean it's, it's it, awesome women's stuff. game is in a, in a delightful position yeah, I think it's it just really it's, is. it's exciting to see where it'll go I think it's growing exponentially everywhere that it's being played and that's yeah. just good Good to see agreed and yeah credit to Australia as well for hosting that tournament as well good to see uh, just women's rugby test footy taking place all over the world um, yeah I, I don't know with it, with that is there anything else that needs saying are we going to sign off on a women, on a great season of women's rugby in the northern hemisphere and look forward to you know this with this new calendar that we're going to have and this new tournament that's got all very exciting so there's the Pacific Four that's coming up actually in June uh, that's that's going to be an exciting one get the US and Canada back involved because yeah, they're um, very very confident as well yeah, we saw a little um, bit of Spain in those qualifiers but it would be nice to see them because they have an interest in it as well but just yeah. more of these teams playing each other the Pacific Four Nations that's, that's, in, that's next month and then obviously in September the Women's World Cup which is all building yeah. towards uh, Ireland unfortunately won't be involved sadly not England of course red hot favourites France and the Black Ferns desperate to close that gap and then the wild cards and of Japan, you know, Wales, Wallaroos will have well, have notions. Fijiana will fancy taking a scalp, I dare say. As well, be, it'll be a great tournament in New Zealand, and we're definitely going to be uh, covering that when it comes along. Hundred uh, percent. But no, I thoroughly enjoyed the Women's Six Nations. Great to see the fans back in, and uh, England a level above for right now removes some of the intrigue from it. But it was it was great stuff all around, and some really compelling games. Absolutely. But yes, with that, we are going to pivot on, and the bulk of the show will be spent 
focused on these two tournaments. We have the Champions Cup and the Challenge Cup, but mainly the Champions Cup, to be honest, as well. And yes, we've we've missed a fair bit. We've reached the denouement of it. It's a couple of weeks from now, not this weekend, but next week. You're going to be there uh, right. in Marseille uh, when it all goes down. We have ha- have our finalists. It's Leinster and La Rochelle in the main event, and it is Lyon and Toulon in the uh, Challenge Cup. We're just going to start by just kind of give, bringing you up to speed very quickly on what's happened in the last few weeks in the Champions Cup, obviously, because we missed a fair few. We, we, the last time we left you, we were halfway through the double headers of the last 16, I believe. Yeah. So it was a, a lot has, ha- has transpired since then. We've obviously had our quarterfinals. Um, started off with an, <laughs> just an epic game between uh, Munster and Toulouse that uh, managed to dominate the headlines in that quarterfinal weekend with good reason. Finished 24 all in the Aviva Stadium and then finished 24 all again after extra time in the Aviva Stadium and went all the way down to penalties. The first look at our new format for penalties ever since that Cardiff Blues Leicester game that ended up having Martin Williams taking one and missing one. Yeah, it's like, yeah. We don't want to see that really. So it was a new system with you know your three kickers slightly off angles one left one right and uh, yeah it was it was Munster who blinked the, the technique didn't hold up under pressure for Ben Healy and then ultimately Connor Murray whereas T- Toulouse just nailed all of theirs yeah and um, I think um, they, they, I mean it, it's a curious one I, I, I don't I think the, the general consensus was sort of tacit approval of the, yeah. of the, of the penalty shoot people enjoyed it, like, it, like it dominated the, the headlines that weekend it, it also interrupted our game which yeah. is annoying yeah. <laughs> so, um, goal kicking is actually at the it's, it's, it's the origin of point scoring in rugby you know you never yeah. used to get a point you didn't for, get for a, try, a try game. that's yeah. why try is try try meant that once you dot it down over there you get to try to kick it at the yeah. goal Con- conversions um, used to be the only way to score you'd, you'd, you'd dot the ball down you get your try and try just meant to have a try have, have a try at kicking a goal so it, it very much goes back to rugby's roots games being decided by the quality of place kickers yeah. and uh, I think it's a fair enough way to to, to split a tie yeah. um, I don't hate it I actually I wouldn't hate I, what I don't like is the is the sort of football style we have to play out a 20 minute extra time I don't yeah. actually I actually prefer like an NFL style first score wins Yeah, I don't think you need to play an extra 20 minutes I don't think there's any good reason why it has to be football style oh we play one half we play another half and then if it's draw it's penalties just do next score wins yeah. I think Yeah, um, I think I actually think that's the cleaner way to do yeah, it I think there's a lot um, of been pe- people who have been talking about that 100 minutes of, of rugby like 80 minutes is more than enough for, yeah, well, for I mean, some people by, by yeah. all means play it and then do it but if uh, I, I would say play it but it's sudden death Yeah, and it, it could even be 15 minutes just one half 15 minutes and then just wrap it up yeah. um, maybe that's about that's maybe that's a bit better more, way to bit do more it. tinkering that, to be done. That, that's burying the lead because as as dramatic a finish as that was, I thought it was Just such a, great a stellar game, game of rugby. Because, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. we're, at this stage, we're looking ahead to a final that includes neither of these teams, so it's probably gratuitous to be spending so much time in this game between Munster and Toulouse. But it was an amazing occasion in the Aviva Stadium. The atmosphere was electric. The whole of uh, of the province of Munster, Munster was emptied. They came up, and yeah. a brilliant crowd at the Aviva, and Toulouse were were. You know, outplayed for most of the game. I mean, Munster's place kicking hurt them actually in regular time as well. They could have been farther ahead, and uh, the game really, it, for me, it changed when the best player on the field, Peter O'Mahony, went off. Munster had a ten point lead with fifteen minutes to go, and they just couldn't replicate the energy that he was bringing. Oh, um, the turnover acumen from him, he was just gobbling them up, gobbling up to to lose offensive sets for fun, and then launch it as well. Lovely handle, ball handling skill. It was a well rounded performance. One of the him. one of the very best if not the best loose forward in terms of form in world rugby right now I would go so far as to say very, very good. some of the Leinster Lucys look absolutely brilliant but I don't think any of them look just as raw brilliant in terms of carrying a team as Peter O'Mahony I mean his breakdown work on the floor it was like watching David Pocock in terms yeah. of at his best in terms of just whenever he was nearly there whenever the pressure was ramped up whenever Toulouse got close to the line there he was guess who was coming up with a miraculous steal and it was like David Pocock it was one of those where you knew it was coming everyone in Toulouse knew to look out for him yeah, but they couldn't, couldn't stop it him, yeah. um, but then at the same time he was getting line out steals he was huge in the carry his handling was brilliant he was just he's a constant playmaker and at his very best one of the absolute finest athletes I mean I think he's absolutely brilliant um, yeah, and no, I, thought, exactly. I, thought I don't was, think anyone would was disagree with that desperate yeah, yeah. desperate uh, look to see him go off injured and I was wondering at the time as I saw him hobble, hobble off whether his Herculean uh, shift had been enough to yeah, see Monster yeah, home and they had the 10 point lead but, sucker punch of a try that yeah, came and it came immediately after he left the field after he'd had one yeah, of his turnovers credit, they to, spent, credit to lose um, they just they know how to win those kinds of games when they're they, they're in that yeah, little they, trap they dug it they out they score quicker they found it off set piece twice they did pick them apart um 
which was very impressive. They weren't playing well. They were totally outplayed, but they still managed to keep in yeah, it long enough to get it two penalties eventually and, to, and held their nerve. To be fair to the three boyos as well, Dupont, Entomac, and, and Ramos. Ramos. Yeah. What cool customers, yeah. all three of them. Ramos I mean, particularly never looked like goal kicking brilliantly as yeah, well yeah, of late. Yeah. And he was taking on the more difficult ones, which Ben Healy obviously couldn't do. That was The story was unfortunate for Ben Healy. He's a young lad. He's a very good kicker, but he, between that and the long-range one in, in, at the end of regular time, he'll, he'll definitely have nightmares of that game. But hopefully galvanising nightmares, and we'll see him come back bigger and better. Make an potentially, because he does have clutch kicks in him. He does, I think, his big kicks in him Even, as even well. guys like Johnny Sexton have had, uh, have had bad moments. You think back to that All Blacks game well, in 2013. Ron O'Gara um, early in his career had a had a European game in which yeah, he missed right. everything as well. And then, yeah, yeah. So he, he he was citing that saying he could he could be galvanised by it. But uh, no, Toulouse were the ones who went marching on from that intense, amazing game of rugby. That was definitely the highlight of quarter final weekend. And um, but then it was followed by Leinster absolutely doing a job on uh, table toppers Leicester in the Premiership out in Welford Road. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was twenty nil in a matter of minutes, wasn't it? It was just yeah. the first quarter was an absolute blitzkrieg in which Leicester were not quite at the pitch and Leinster were so accurate and so ruthless and looking cup final mode, which is where they've ultimately ended up. And it was, uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting tale. There's been a, a bit of that in terms of uh, just the, like Leicester have looked imperious in their club competition and they looked like they they were they were they haven't lost they hadn't mm. lost up until that in Welford Road this year and they were completely blown away by Leinster on yeah. this occasion. I mean, I, I think um, it's it's something that's been put into context as well by the performance of the other English clubs mm-hmm. in Europe this year. Just that th- what they don't have fundamentally is enough pressure defense in the Premiership. True. That's what's missing. A lot of these teams are finding scores way very easily, easily yeah. in the Premiership. And are struggling to create them in Europe because when they come up, they come up against these pressure defenses or these turnover either defenses. Irish teams or all yep. French teams as well. Yep. Like we saw in the Challenge Cup twice uh, yeah. at the weekend, just gone that just you know the English sides couldn't deal, mm. couldn't keep the ball against the breakdown the, pressure ex- again in both Exeter as well in the last sixteen yep. against Munster just could not could not attack, and that was kind of Leinster are not a turnover defense, but they are a pressure defense, yep. and they just put Leicester's multi phase under too much pressure. George Ford who's a lovely silky footballer in the premiership and when he's given a bit of space and time and a proper pocket to kind of work with he'll pick all kinds of delicious passes and make the right decisions but when you really ramp up the pressure on him he kind of tends he to make mistakes and he and he sits back deep and yeah they what Leicester resolved to do was just kick it yeah. and again a, a fool's errand against a team with well, Hugo Keenan, Keenan in the backfield back and, and then James Lowe to counter with yeah, and, was, yeah no they, they dominated them to be honest it was great uh, J- James Ryan actually re- returned with that one and had a standout performance Robbie Henshaw was also brilliant as was Josh yeah. van der Fleer as he always d- has d- defence and yeah. then the big turnovers at the line out and then the physicality but really just clinicality one team yeah. could score in the red zone and the other team couldn't indeed and yeah. Leinster saw at home without being too silky away from home on that narrow pitch and yeah. they completely shut down what Leicester were bringing outside of some defensive mall wibbles and yeah. then found the tries that they needed early in the game to, to, to create that unassailable lead that was it was it. a very impressive performance from our charges yeah and um, we were delighted with it as well um, then the other quarterfinal La Rochelle coasted past Montpellier in the all French one um, Willemse and Reinach were missing for Montpellier and as it turns out that was kind of the heartbeat of their team think, as I they think, were night and day different Willems is obviously a huge player he's been in such good form this year he, he adds a, such heft to their scrum he adds yeah. such work right around the field and just, just, just raw physicality and everything in the tight areas Willems is going to give you that but the bigger loss is Reinach because the Reinach tempo, is the, the tempo oh, Reinach gets that team moving he does and that team like sometimes they just refuse to move I mean they have to be really dragged kicking and screaming into moving sometimes but Reinach does it. I mean, he has this this real energy and this quality to him. And I tell you, the Springboks would be good enough to have him. They need. They hopefully he can get fit back in time for rugby championship time for the Springboks because I think he's the form South African scrum half, and he might be the form scrum half in the world. I think he's a sensational he's player. Very very good. He moves to the fair. ball so well, and I think without him. I think actually the, like when you look at Montpellier being top of the top couture's and then you look at them playing without Reinach and you wonder why Reinach was a lot of the reason I mean, yeah. he just he just demands that that team play some good ball it's true and, um, it's true uh, and without, without him they, yeah, they, they, they played okay against La Rochelle but they never it never felt like they were going to win um, what yeah. about yeah Jonathan Dante sitting down Andre was Pollard it Dante or was it bo- bo- oh, it was, it was, it was Body I thought yeah, yeah, yeah. Body was on at that point and yes he sat down Pollard at 12 yeah Pollard has not been playing great stuff of late uh, in Montpellier no, moved um, him to 12 and 
you know, it, 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 from a test rugby point of view, South Africa definitely has some soul searching to do to find a ten, unless they want to just trust Manny Labok, who's Manny the actual Labok is form, the form ten. 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if, if you're in Bok colours, that's probably true. Or Faf to ten with Reinach at nine, that's mental. Yeah. But yeah, it it just could, might work. It could be fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, they get absolutely. La Rochelle were night and day better. Like Vito was having a field day. Aldri, Rates, Lades, it, it, they they looked just comfortable again that uh, quarter final against Montpellier, and then the final one as well was similar in terms of like we were talking about the English teams v French teams Sale with with the, the, the closest you could get to a pressure defence in the Premiership is That's Sale's right. defence they're pretty aggressive they do try and be proactive with it they're the it one amounted team. to 22 yeah. points that they scored away from, from home in the U Arena but Racing scored 41 points you know yeah. and you know, Sale just don't score enough points no. full stop they don't, well, it's not even um, a question of scoring points they actually they got into the red zone and Acker van der Merve took a nice try and they yeah, actually, they actually they, had improved they, on what they showed last year yeah. when they met a team that were yeah. at that level and they couldn't score at they, all they, so. they were clinical enough but yeah. at the same time they just don't in the middle of the field they don't use the ball well enough. Yeah. They try and create these opportunities to pre- put their pressure defence on teams, generate penalties, get down in the red zone and score. But when you're playing a team like Racing, they, they defended them gamely for the most part, but they just they kicked the ball so often they just gave up too many opportunities. And it, it only takes a moment. It only well, takes one or two moments like for it to go in right. In the arena and, uh, as well. Like you can't yeah. just keep kicking them the ball and expect and, to keep the score below 40. And yeah, that, they, uh, that was kind of it. It was just a couple of magical moments um, from, from Teddy Thomas. And, yeah. and one him of and even Finn Russell with that kick that just uh, oh, yeah, that uh, came back towards him the little fly hack yeah, and the it, was, fly, it, was, it was actually there was a fair bit of footballing going on in that game yeah, there was a fair yeah. bit of dribbling going on uh, for, for, for all throughout as well from both sides but uh, yeah that probably the highlight was that Finn double fly hack try as well that was really really no, good I mean the highlight for me was the Finn grubber and then the mi- the mythical gather by Tim Tommy oh, yeah, that was, that was very insane. very good yeah there was some um, box office rugby in that one quarterfinals often a good one for, for just some razzle dazzle as well and yeah it really did deliver the quarterfinal weekend I thought mainly because of that that monster drama that already yeah, had the credit so in the bank good. before anything else happened and then there were some great plays in the other games as well but then we had uh, from, from 8 that went into 4 and that led us into the first of the semi-finals um, which we had only just the weekend just gone and uh, yeah it uh, our own charges Leinster were up against Toulouse in the, the all-star game as many stars as you can possibly have in a game five stars plays four stars defending champs versus you know per- per- perennial contenders in Leinster and uh, this time it was Leinster who took the W and did so convincingly probably in no in, thanks in no small part to Munster's efforts the week before and the 100 minutes of rugby and the, the fact that they had to travel back home and then back to Dublin Toulouse did look a little bit leggy but Leinster looked anything but they looked immediately aggressive the aggressor and when they took the field and yeah 40 points to 17 was probably a fair reflection of the difference between the two sides on the day like it was it was padded a bit by a late Hugo Keenan try to to make it that 40 point margin but to be honest with the amount that uh, Leinster created versus the amount that Toulouse managed to create and one of Toulouse's tries the opening try coming from just a you know, a, a, a straight error from from Gibson Park on the offensive end that mm. led to Dupont to run eighty minute meters unopposed. They didn't really generate that many opportunities to lose, and they did drop a lot of uncharacteristic ball in the middle third and allow mm. Leinster to get after them um, and no. put their put them under pressure. Not unlike the um, the the France England match that uh, we were talking about earlier, um, the women's game, yeah, the Six Nations decider. It was it was a case of the French team playing just that little bit more free form, that little bit less organized, and yeah. um, that usually works okay for them because they've got the talent to suck players in and then work it to the edge by keeping the offload game going. Um, but Leinster scramble defense and pressure defense, scramble on the edge and pressure on the on the on the inside was absolutely perfect, and it really it just swallowed up all the space that Toulouse had to work with. It was yeah. it was an opus performance from the Leinster defense, which has been great all year. Um, just suffocating that Toulouse attack in the midfield and it then did. it was just drop after drop after drop and then frustration after frustration after frustration um, but the joyous part of the game the glorious part of the game is what Leinster are doing on offence and it's yeah. it's so it's so clean like everything they're doing is so clean with Sexton and Gibson Park working so well together they have all kinds of little variations in their starter plays just to work Sexton into that pocket that they've created for him a special little Tom Brady pocket that they've made for him they've just created the position of quarterback to suit old man Johnny and it was perfect to watch him just manipulate them time and time again I mean there were probably two or three moments in the match 
where Toulouse actually got the read on what Leinster were doing, made the right decision, got a hit on Sexton on the ball. Um, but for the most part, they were chasing shadows. I mean, they yeah. were Leinster were flooding the inside with all of these different options, and they would just take them. They would just take the cheap options. Sexton, he's just he got the ball. He would just if Toulouse were putting the pressure on and shutting down the passing lanes, he'd just give the simple ball. But Leinster's breakdown work was so clean. Their footwork and the contact was perfect, and they were running en- enough angles and enough variations that Toulouse weren't able to tackle them on the front foot. The jackal game wasn't there and then Leinster so quick to fold into their shape the yeah. ball just recycles they go straight into the next pattern and Toulouse are just chasing shadows and yeah. Sexton's giving that ball giving that ball giving that ball all day long until they get the read on and then he just holds it shows goes and straight in and, and lovely uh, little oh. pass to find Josh Rader. that was for the second which put a bit of daylight between the sides but even the first try which was the James Lowe try that was I think it was Brian O'Driscoll and Combs talking about like they were one second rooks and it was four of them and it's like you may be able to defend three phases mm. at a push but if you get four phases with one second rooks yeah, each time close it's, to your line it's, you're just not going to stop it's them it's because of the misdirection yeah. it's because they, they can, you can't you can't have someone sort of waiting to go into that jackal because there's so many different options everyone has to cover one and it's just Sexton and, and the t- the the general offence yeah, the shape Gibson that it's in Park as well, between, good, yeah, between the things. two of them the right options are being taken consistently they're getting the edge and the contact and then everyone is folding into the shape to the point where you they have literally most of the time just one forward hitting the rook hitting the rook you have one ball carrier usually a forward the nearest forward to him hitting the rook and everyone else is getting back into shape before the, the carrier is even on the deck then the ball is gone again and it's just that same offense time and time again to lose uh, try and get the read on it try and slow it up they end up fouling quite a bit to Mayafu three, three, yes, three times three times he hit Gibson Park and it was the third one that was close to the line that he did just get carded for mm. but he was he was begging to be carded for that exact off, uh, offense on a, a previous occasions but yeah it was it was courtesy of the pressure that they were, they were just not able to slow just down or do what they were chasing, chasing shadows, chasing shadows the time. it's just a lovely rhythm to what Leinster I mean people talk about what a great game Robbie Henry Shaw had and rightly so and he, he was so dominant on the Cash carry Vander Fleer and Doris but, but, were mighty as well but, but he, uh, he never like Robbie Henshaw just never got a bad ball that's true he, too. he just never got a bad every single time he touched the ball he was one on one with a defender on the back foot with options either side of him I mean he was just for, no, that, for a destructive game line. yeah he for was, a destructive ball carrier he just couldn't have been asked for better service yeah and but it was because of all of the comp- the complexity of what they're doing on the inside it's com- it's complex but it's also simple it's just done at speed but the, sh- the shape is so consistent there there's consistently four options and then the, the little subtle changes are what they're doing with their footwork where sometimes they step in sometimes yeah. the pass is coming back on the inside on the outside it was just constantly confusing yeah. and then in the end if it's just a Henshaw hit up everyone's been chasing shadows looking at everything Henshaw gets the ball a little on the edge and all of a sudden you've a flat footed outside centre trying to cling on to him and he's yeah. away past the game line it was just happened it, all the like, time it that, was, that exact scenario yeah, it couldn't have been nicer for, for a guy like Henshaw to play well, I was actually delighted for uh, Maloney as well Maloney was absolutely brave. his best yeah. game in blue and it's been his best season in blue he's been a stalwart in this team now with uh, in, in the lock position but he was doing masterful at that pullback pass mm. and including the one that created that sexton gap that created the Van, Van der Fleer try yeah um, he was mighty throughout basic skills are so basic on point. skills are like um, well and then even less basic skills when your tight head props furlong is flicking out skip passes to your fullback as well like off the right hand it was a year yeah, ago or a year and a half ago during the, the sort of couple of seasons where Leinster were losing those big knockout games and they were winning ugly in the URC or the Pro 14 as it was we were lamenting the fact that whether be it anyone who wasn't named Sexton just couldn't be backed to throw a 15 metre pass accurately yeah. Yeah, you got the tight head doing it. Yeah, I mean, the, the skills have come skills on. Skills can be worked on. It's year. been yeah. demonstrated by a few things. Sure, we knew that with Andy Friend and Connacht turning them from a very ugly team into, or not even Andy Friend from Pat Lamb's era turning them from a very very ugly team into a an all skills all balling kind of team. Yeah. It can be worked on. It can be improved. And yeah, Leinster have definitely improved it this year um, compared to where they were last year when they were losing to La Rochelle by going reverting to type and kind of doing one out runners to James Ryan a lot of the time. Well, and it's getting just swallowed it, up. It, 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 um, Leinster story last. Last year was that they were the biggest, meanest, most physical team in the Pro 14, and they were leaning on that to get wins against the likes of Glasgow and Scarlets, etc. And then they ran into a team that was bigger and meaner than them in Europe, and they didn't have an answer. Yeah, this team does look a lot better. It does look like um, it has more yeah, of an answer. Yeah. Sure, they just beat 
to lose by, was by like, 23 oh, points. It was like that's so like I didn't know, even talk about James Lowe. <laughs> James Lowe, it, uh, just the 10 tries, tournament top try score. Didn't quite fall for Jimmy O'Brien in that game. He didn't uh, didn't quite manage it, but James Lowe still gonna gonna grab obligatory tries, and uh, he's not. It's 10 and counting because the final's still to come, and I wouldn't bet against him scoring one in it. Win, lose, or draw, he'll probably be on the score sheet because uh, yeah, he's been in fantastic form, fantastic form. Ringrose has also improved his form, and yeah, just yeah, they're a very very good team. They're our team. We're they're a joy to watch at the minute. And yeah, I mean yeah. set piece is actually a little dodgy. That's it is. the one thing. It, the and offense and the defense Furlong did go off like it was a barn story. It was as good a thirteen minute showing as as any prop yeah. has ever given ever. Yeah. But he Nearly. was off the field after thirteen minutes and he was limping at full time. So he is a doubt for for the yeah. final, and that is a worry because uh, yeah, the last time like the set piece has creaked. It creaked when Genge put them under pressure in in Welford Road. It creaked again a few times when Toulouse were putting the squeeze on. I dare creaked, say La Rochelle creaked, creaked will, in the defensive will. mall against. Yeah. Uh, against against Leicester as well, so the dif- the defense is a big concern. There's just no doubt about that. Yeah. Uh, no, not the defense. Sorry, the the defense, piece. but the set piece in general Indeed. is 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 a concern. But the offense and the defense are ahead of everyone else, and that's that's, true. that's the exciting thing. They're a joy to watch at the moment, they Leicester. Are. And uh, are, are were they were favorites going in? They're top of all the stats, to be honest. Try scored and points scored and whatnot. So they are going into this final as favorites. But uh, yeah, we're not going to overlook the other semi final as well, which took place the all French affair. Um, it uh, it took place up in Lons, which was probably ill advised. I know Ronan O'Gara was and and the La Rochelle faithful were displeased with that because it's a few hours north of Paris, right on the Belgian border, right below below Lille, and it was like a seven or something hour trip from the La, for La Rochelle with no flights available if if any of them wanted to go. So attendance wasn't great for it as such. There was one stand full, but it wasn't wasn't kind of a full one with a week's notice to sell tickets, and it was a bit silly to put it on up there. But the game itself was a bit scrappy for it as well, to be honest. It finished uh, La Rochelle 20, uh, Racing 13. That was blown out in with a try at the very, very death, though, for Ehi West, uh, for La Rochelle. It was a tight one. It was a very, very tight one all throughout. Um, It... it you know, it promised a bit more because both of these sides had been up there on the uh, try scored, on the point scored, on the offloads as well, the, with the KBA approach of La Rochelle and just the kind of razzle dazzle, sexy rugby of Rassing. And yet it was, it was Rassing were the ones who were kind of flying that flag and trying to play a bit. Rassing did suffer for losing Enyukanye just pre kick off, their mm-hmm. tight hit, and then they were squeezed all day at scrum at that particular set piece by La Rochelle. But La Rochelle. It was bewildering to watch because I'm all for KBA and and I think it, like as in keep the ball alive. There needs and I'm sure like it's not the coach saying it as well. Like there needs to be some kind of sense of knockout rugby with it as well. Like mm. when you've created a line break, which they did so many times with one or two offloads. Like once you bust up fifty meters and get to the twenty two, just because you feel kind of don't throw it over your shoulder to no one, which yeah, they yeah, did yeah. all the time. <laughs> like that's yeah, yeah. that's not KBA. That's killing the ball. It's killing Tr- your ball. Trying to keep um, the tempo up. And the funny yeah. thing is that that'll be part of their recipe to try and beat uh, Leinster. They True. just have to be more. Uh, they just have to be a lot better in terms of um, they getting getting their support players into a bit of shape. But yep. definitely, rook prevention is a, is is a rook key preven- weapon for rook them. Prevention, sure, uh, but throwing the ball away. Is just no, I know, but it, that's yeah, the yeah. point: is that you just need to check your run, take ride the tackle for a second, and then find some a support runner and and find that offload and be a little bit more secure, protect the ball, but also keep it alive. Yeah. Um. But at the same time, like I thought that La Rochelle. I thought they were really, really poor they in the were. game. I just thought they were very sloppy. I thought they were dominant in every, and very poor. In everything they did, yeah. I thought they were really sloppy for a team that was dominant up front. I mean, to frankly, they were they were blessed to get a penalty try and a second yellow card. Yes, that was and, and a, ref, a referee's that, interpretation yeah. that you just you would very rarely see when there's a breakaway from from a mall and the and the the um, the. Uh, players already broken away and then the existing mall which no longer has the ball in it is taken out by a guy who's kind of falling backwards and doesn't know too much about it yeah. and in the meantime uh, your player has has the ball over the line and, and fails to ground it yes, and the referee very, decides very to bail you out and give you a penalty try on, on the base like how would that have been a try already when the the mall was pulled down after, as your man was breaking away? I just I just don't see how it impacts the try at all. Yeah. The try that would have been that the it should have been a try, but the guy fails to ground fails to ground the ball over the line. 
it's a generous interpretation that gives them what ends up being really and truly the winning score. It was I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was, it just the whole game just left such a flat taste in my mouth because neither, actually, si- neither side went and won it. No, Both it sides like were the poor. opening I mean, quarter was decent, uh-huh. where like uh, Vakatawa's opening try was really well taken because it was a poor pass behind yeah, him. He yeah. gathered, beat a man, and slammed it down authoritatively. That was really good. And um, Aldrit's opening score from the base of the scrum was really good yeah, as well. Yeah, Dominant yeah. scrum, pick and jam, bur- burrow over the nine, and then it was like, oh, game on. We got an all French game, and from there yeah between La Rochelle so dominating tetchy. all the tight tight exchanges but the place kicking being abysmal for Mihaya West not for the first time but a really poor yeah, place yeah. kicking display for Mihaya West meaning they couldn't accrue points that way it's terribly unclinical with the ball because they created time and time again they created half break breaks and they, just threw the yeah, ball they, to deck they, after they, it they certainly had um, front foot ball but the, the structure was loose it looked like they were blowing it and then yeah. but then Rossing Rassing there, blew it right back at them as well because Rassing had two clear cut moments that and Teddy Thomas was at the heart of all of them. And yeah. The first one, it, it the pass to him was forward, and from there he hurdled a man and went in for yeah, what would have yeah, been yeah. a try, but it was a forward pass, so it was no go. And then the other one, the fault was on him because yeah, like it should have been a one, should have been a one him of try. Yeah. Finn had already found Finn, the pass. And, it was and, just that and, was the moment. And he knew as soon as Teddy just dummies and tries to go himself, and Finn throws his hands up in the air like mm. no, and it was yeah. on about sixty eight minutes. And the way Rassing, the way La Rochelle were playing. That they, they weren't. It. They weren't coming back to win no. it. They, they, they weren't doing anything with the ball. It was it, if Racing had taken that score, they would have won it. And, and from a Racing's point of view, I mean, they can talk about you know refereeing decisions, etc. And um, but for a side that has set out their stall of we want to win this competition, we're desperate to win this competition. For a side with all the offensive pedigree that they have, to not go and find that try when the but space to not was there, throw the pass. It's I wouldn't have thought they'd be the team to not throw the pass. Now maybe throw the pass inaccurately yeah. over over into touch. Sure, that's yeah. the error I would have thought they might have made. Um, but yeah, yeah, to, like, yeah and unfortunately, it, it was that it was a game that was more about mistakes than about than about great plays. I thought. No, it's true, um, and, and, and uh, I th- did think there was a cruel irony both in Ehi West grabbing the final try that uh, that pushed it out to a to a seven point game, yeah. but also just in the manner. Of that try because La Rochelle having spent the whole game doing KBA but not really KBA just just killing their own ball by throwing it this mm. way and that to no one they were killing the clock and they were picking and jamming and it was, as and it was as the most had, effective yeah. thing it might have been yeah. an uglier game but they could just because they were so dominant physically they could just pick and jam pick and jam pick and jam and right at the 80th minute when they were about to kick it off they saw that it's actually there's a try right there because we picked and there's no one left we can just yeah. try to be fair so, I think, I think, I think Rassing, oh, Rassing were, were done, done and they that were that done stage. at that point um, but it was it was pointed out that it was like maybe that could have been a tactic that they would have employed a bit more against this Rassing side perhaps and maybe they'd, they'd learn those lessons and try and do it a bit to Leinster who knows but uh yeah, there was it was you're right to say a game that was characterized more by errors than anything else. And semi-finals are often that way. Like the the thing that can be said about it is they're in the final La Rochelle. Yeah, well, like to, all you have to, to do with a semi final I mean, is win la- it. Last year um, Toulouse Bordeaux was an absolutely appalling game or obviously. It's true. Toulouse went and won the final. That's I mean, true. That was, all they had yeah. to do was get there and uh Raj will be happy that his side dug it out and they used their strength. I mean they have a much better forward pack they than, do. than like Rassing. Especially Rassing That's, minus in Yukanya. Yeah, that was the, that is tough, tough like losing a tight head pre kickoff, particularly a Springbok you, World Cup winning tight head pre kickoff. Virtually your only credentialed forward. And that was the other thing that that mm. is a story of the season for Racing is that if you want to win Europe, you're going to need a better pack. Their mm. pack is just a little lightweight for this business end of the competition. And as much as the mole uh, Sinbin was incredibly harsh for my money, and it also nullified um, Camille Shah, who's another box office. Yeah, he was exactly. just in off the bench and making an impact, and there he was. Yeah, gone and that, for was 10 the, that was the other one. Was that the Sinbin on Shah? Was, yeah. he, he was the wrong man. He yeah. wasn't the player who took off the scrum half. It was a really shoddy refereeing performance. I think it was Matt Carney. Yes, um, there were just, a few. He got, the wrong, he got the wrong man on that Sinbin call as well so yeah but but at the same time they didn't find the try and the pack that they were rocking up with wasn't good enough to win the tournament and, and they need to go back and reflect on that and maybe change some things but um, yeah a, a tough one for Racing for a team determined to win the competition to go out with a performance like that yeah. That'll that'll live it's long in the memory. I dare say. I dare say. Yeah. Well, like to be honest, I've I've never really had faith. Um, it's it's kind of the you know it's the same thing that happens to PSG in the football. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. just Parisian clubs with a bunch of mercenaries who are very box office in the springtime. Yeah, and less so in the summertime when the business <laughs> end comes round. You know, um, there might be some truth. There is a little right. bit of truth. Sure, even Finn's post match interviews like the undertones of like ah you know could have been. My car, I still live in Paris. My car is very nice. You know, like, yeah, it's it's, there's, there's truth to it. It's tough to go to the well. <laughs> a nugget there. I mean, yeah, poor old 
Finn, I mean, he's a brilliant player, but is he is he ever going to win a trophy of import? I don't um, know. Well, it's not going to be the Champions Cup this year because La Rochelle are the team that go marching on to the final, to Marseille. And that is where the business end of this season. It's been a great campaign, great knockout season. I really enjoyed the uh, the double header. We obviously didn't didn't look back on the, the second of the double headers, but that's ancient history now. But we had yeah. last 16 with real stakes with two uh, double headers. We had really good quarterfinals footy with dramatic penalties and all kinds of stuff going going on two very distinct semi-finals one absolutely glorious performance from Leinster that was imperious and then you're more typical there's normally one semi-final that's a bit scuttery and a bit kind of tight and inaccurate and that was the all French one and it had all roads have led us to this uh, Leinster versus La Rochelle in the 2022 final um what a game, what a yeah. game. A replay of last year's semi-final, which was won by nine points by uh, La Rochelle and won in rather a dominant physical fashion last time these two sides met. So despite the fact that Leinster are Bucky's favourites, and they are, and I've seen some ludicrously uh, ridiculous odds going on this particular game for considering it's a two-horse race in which the the underdog won the last matchup between these two and yet I've seen ridiculously short odds on Leinster yeah well I mean um, it, it was, there was a lot of that chat was made in advance of the Leinster Toulouse game as well and, yeah. and they, the bookies were proven right on that one not to say that uh, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm counting chickens or anything um, I'm going to be at this game I'm going to be going to Marseille very excited about that uh, so I'll be delivering you live reports potentially well no but reflective reports reflective. with potentially some footage of, 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 of myself there at the big game yeah. back in the boys in blue because uh, it's not every year that uh, your side gets to play in a European final no these uh, are worth, is, worth cherishing it's not right. every year you get to back a team like this I mean I, they are everyone's favourites for a reason Leinster they've been playing some absolutely staggeringly good rugby on the offence and defence at the moment it's been it's been a brilliant brilliant run really all season long right back to the start of the season when Sexton came back um, uh, uh, from obviously he wasn't in that Lions tour he came back into the team and then were just purring away nicely they went straight into November with Ireland had that sensational run where they beat the All Blacks yeah. um, then uh, it went off uh, uh, did the job in the kind of the hodgepodge group stages yeah. came in came into the Six Nations had a great Six Nations were undone by France law, uh, learned some lessons there but they've come back they haven't missed a beat they're just playing test level really high quality offense and sneakily really really high level defense that yeah. no real club offense has been able to break down all year and so naturally enough I think the intrigue the interesting thing to start off with to talk about is if you're Ronan O'Gar if you're La Rochelle what are you doing to to undermine and get after this Leinster team well and I think well, go on. No, go on. I think part of it is is impose yourselves physically, which is what they were so successful with last year. It's set piece. It's kind of the the very very core of the game, trying to deny that ball. It is slow down the rook ball. They are very combative in the breakdown. They're very effective. They had a field mm-hmm. day against Rossing last last week, just turning over any ball that they wanted, pretty much. Well, yeah. As soon as there was an isolated breakdown, they need to be on that to slow down and peel for ball from Leinster. Is is pivotal for La Rochelle um, but also they're going to have to place kick a bit better they're going to have to kick generally a bit better than they did in that semi-final one would think they're going to have to protect the pill themselves a little bit better if they're going to want to try and exert some pressure with ball in hand so there's going to be improvements that you can cite like one of the good things about performing so like under par under the par they've set for themselves in, in, in the, the semi-final and with Leinster looking as imperious as they do is that from Roger's point of view there's there's no motivation needs to and you can point at all of those things and just be like we know we're going to have to be much better than we were, than we have been and that should be able to get, mm. the, get the boys up for that kind yeah. of level of performance yeah I mean there's obviously the, the game is multi-layered and multifaceted and there's kicking dynamics and, and so many different dynamics to it but um, of your four main areas I suppose are your kicks your set piece and your offence and your defence mm. and then um, uh, starting with Leinster like Leinster's main strengths ahead of everything else the quality of what they're doing on offence and defence at the moment is staggeringly good yeah. you have to start by looking at that offence I mean Toulouse have a good jackal game they got one solid steal off, off Julian Marchand but for the most part Leinster and their rhythmic offence with their multi-options we're shutting down the turnover options simply by occupying all the defense, all of the defense with so many options, picking a preferable one, winning that contact, and then instantly through ball presentation and footwork and just one forward hitting the rook, presenting the ball and going again, and right away they're in their shape. It's a glorious thing to watch them do. Yeah. And I think when you're, when you're looking at... Like, Toulouse had the most success towards the end of the game when they just... they 
they bull rush the pullback option, the attack the pocket yeah. of Sexton, and I think that's what you have to do if you're if you're if you're La Rochelle here. I think you have you're to shut down the outside and, and say, sending. yeah, you're just like, force them to win it on the inside. Force yeah. them to like it, it, Sexton is going to be running that, and, and whether it's Hugo Keenan as well or Gary Ringrose in some certain phases, they want to get that pullback going. They want to get that second pod involved as early and as often as possible, so they can have that kind of pivot position where a ten, where they where Sexton or one of the backs can pick the killer pass. What you need to be able to do is to just shut that down and force them to kind of keep working the inside, keep taking that sort of check down option. Yeah. And I, and I think I force think, them into the path of Aldris or someone else that they break down correct. and yeah. yeah, and, and, and Big Will Skelton if he's back in time. I know yeah. him and Antonio are doubts. Obviously they'd be huge if they could get them both back and firing. And would but be winning huge the, if they can't if they yeah, lose exactly. both of them, that's a like massive it, effect. It is a different game if you bull rush the, the, the pullback option, as in send a shooter in his direction force Leinster to occupy within their first pod and you're winning big contacts with yeah. big tackles that is how you probably like you look at France in, in in the Six Nations against Ireland unsticking them with just big slow tackles on the inside making everything messy and, and slow and slow and then yeah. all of a sudden you know there isn't the room there isn't the space for Sexton and all of a sudden and Leinster are kicking speed for and it's a different part. game yeah, no, just exactly. a different game so that, I think the defence is the first port of call and the, the nuggets are there in terms of how you can shut, shut it down but it starts with as often as possible taking Sexton out of the game Sexton's the guy who gets it purring if you can just limit his, limit his possessions and punish him for even receiving a pass by having a big Dante or someone like that in his face yeah. that's a huge part of the blueprint for just narrowing up what Leinster are trying to do Leinster have been so good at working Sexton into space I mean they keep flooding the inside channels with all kinds of options they'll work one phase two phase three phase even off first phase once or twice they've they've had moves where they go flying off the top of the line out to 12 Gibson Park is looping around and Sexton is all of a sudden so wide he's practically in the 13 channel yeah. but even then I think you should obviously be switching within your roles but there needs to be someone shooting up on Sexton yeah. because he is the guy who Leinster want to get in the ball and when he's in the ball he's the guy who's going to make the killer decision he's not the guy who's going to run through and, and Damien McKenzie or Bowden Barrett you but he, once the ball gets into his hands the right option's coming and then the danger men are on the ball in the right positions get after him True. to man yeah. mark him yeah. do not let him get involved I also want to try and manhandle yeah. people like like the very impressive Josh van der Fleer and, and Keevan Doris and, and these kinds of guys just kind of get on top of them in those contacts and slow them down because the ball playing skills of the forward is it forwards is what creates that space it's very tough to defend but if you can be dominant if you can sit them down if you can get them moving backwards then that's going to be the first port of call for uh, La Rochelle From, on the offensive point of as well they're going to have to tidy up significantly with the ball because you're going to yeah. have to score like Leinster even if you defend really really well Leinster are going to score some points so La Rochelle are going to need to score in mm. this final to win it and yeah. they're going to, to do so against this Leinster defence which like you can get distracted trying to stop Sexton and all this from the fact that Leinster's defence is very very good Correct. and puts you yeah. under a lot of pressure that's what happened to yeah. Leinster I mean Leinster did a great job defending Leinster and it's something that Racing can take the nugget of but Leinster in the tight areas had enough quality and you suspect they will have enough quality to get to the to the reasonable tally of I think it was 20 anyway in the first half yeah. um, and it was only I think 23 overall wasn't it yeah. I think it 23 points and that was by being clinical enough to get to grab a couple of tries in the red zone you have to expect that if you're La Rochelle yeah. but what the flip side was was Leicester doing all that work on Leicester's offence they, they couldn't break down their defence yeah. and it, it, it's a it's a curious one um, like you know, they defend Leinster defended so well against Toulouse. They they defended the edge freakishly well to the point where like Toulouse were doing the KBA thing. Dupont was getting multiple touches on the ball, and then he or Entomac were seeing space on the outside space that would be would that they were so well to they would do so well to exploit. They were flicking the ball over there with their huge quality of pass. But Leinster, in a kind of a, a nearly a, a dare I say it a Springbok kind of way. The, that they were staying so alert on the defensive end and, and the scramble defence was shutting down the edge consistently yeah. and every time Toulouse tried to get to the edge get LaBelle involved it just wasn't there yeah. by the time it got there Leinster scramble defence Ringrose or Henshaw was there mm -hmm. they all swarmed they all made the tackles then they bring the pressure up on the inside and in the end Toulouse were just wilting and dropping the ball and turning it over and La Rochelle on semi-final form would, would be doing exactly that yeah um, well I they're think, going to need it's going to be a big performance from whoever's at half back as well because I think Carbarlo is out with right, a broken yeah. hand he was, he was icing that at the end of that game and he has been the tempo setter for that like he granted he had a 
poor game, I thought, even up to breaking his hand in that uh, semi-final. He but, he has, did. but he has been their nine and he has been the go-to kind of tempo setter for them. So that'll that'll change things on the offensive end, but it'll demand, it, they, they need to, you know, get after them, I think, in the tight. They need big performances, stand-up performances mm-hmm. from guys like Aldrit, guys like Vito, who's been great. On, the two on of the them have been brilliant. Um, they yeah, have been brilliant absolutely. sources of go-forward ball and of, mm. of good quality offloading and kind of getting Danny in Danny Prizo as well. Danny Prizo's been brilliant um, in the yeah, loose, yeah. to be fair. Um, absolutely. So yeah, those kinds of guys are going to need to have massive performances to try and get it, get it through or around this Leinster defence. You've got to think it's mm. about winning a contact and getting an offload and then you might be in behind. Yeah, I, think, I think you're um, right. I think I, you were talking about the tail end of the Rassin game just being physical. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think like Ronan O'Gara will be thinking where were we impressive in the semi-final where are we most impressive where do we match up best against this Leinster side it's, it's in the tight yeah. it's in the tight five it's in those areas like there's no, Leinster's defence is absolutely brilliant they, they bring a lot of pressure they have guys like Caelan Darris and Josh van der Feer coming flying out of the line and then this, if you get out even this, wider yeah, Robbie Henshaw yeah, no, and, and to be fair like and Robbie Henshaw and Gary Ringrose at the moment are not being messed with I actually don't think you're winning it out there I think you're much more likely sending your big men down narrow channels if you can get a bit of tempo and a bit of rhythm going Leinster give you the ball. Leinster yeah. aren't a jackling team. I mean, they really aren't. They have no, precious they, they, few what they do, what they do is, is not um, commit to rooks. That's yeah. what they've been doing for the last few seasons is actually just evacuate yeah. the rook area as quickly as possible because you're not going to get pinned for not rolling. Back on your feet, yeah. back in the line. And then you, when you have Hugo Keenan back in fullback, you kind of cover all the space. Exactly, um, yeah. yeah. The, the kicking game is a, is a non-runner unless you can really back your quality of a guy like Dylan Lades to just outmatch Hugo Keenan. I don't particularly love the matchup there. Where I like the matchup is in the tight. Is is literally you get your ready air or whoever's playing nine just round the corner, round the corner. We're going to win contacts. We're going to have latchers. It's going to be rhythmic. It's going to be ugly, but we're going to keep going round the corner, round the corner. And you want James Ryan and these Leinster forwards who are are very very good, but not the biggest in the world to be feeling their weight, feeling yeah. their weight constantly and moving backwards. And then all of a sudden, the energy that Leinster have been bringing yeah. on defense might just wilt a little bit yeah. or just you'll, you'll get a yeah. soft shoulder and one of these little offloads Victor Vito around the back and yes. then you're in behind and then a try could come from that because Correct. the, like, yeah. the system isn't going to break unless you just get the line break through with your physicality and with a, with a, a touch of class here and there but be selective with that the latter part the, the offloading because mm-hmm. a repeat of what they were doing in the semi-final will lead to a cricket score if they're just turfing balls oh, for randomly sure. for yeah, Leinster yeah, to yeah. gobble up and, and transition with yeah, that's just like no win those contacts win those contacts yeah. So that is the, the, the blueprint. It's a, it's a mammoth task. Leinster are very good and, and they will lose some plays. Guys like Dan Sheehan, like Toulouse trying to trying to play some red zone offense on all of a sudden Dan Sheehan picked up one of their men and, and, and drove him back half, half halfway up the field. Yeah. Like those superlative plays do come out of the Leinster's, Leinster's dynamic pack. It's, it's not an easy task beating them up up front, but it is probably their bet, their best course. Where they match up legitimately better potentially is in the scrum, yeah, and and that's an area they depends really on the personnel for sure. Like um, Antonio, yeah, they yeah. will want Antonio there, but yeah, they'll Prizo get after uh, get after whoever's if a tight head for if it's or even if it's tight Furlong. I mean, Leinster scrum has been middle of the pack this year. It, has, it really hasn't it has. been any better than that. No, it's true. And even um, Porter, Porter has come back a little bit. Yeah, yeah you know, they're, they're, they're the he's not the force he once was. This um, this is also yeah, true. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, there's there's definitely. Chinks, as much as there are two absolutely great hookers who they who do rotate, there are chinks in that front row. There's slight, they're slightly light in the lock. To be honest, since probably since Scott Fardy disappeared from mm-hmm. from the mix for them, they're a little bit light in the in the in the second row in the engine room in the in the young players. There's a lot of young locks coming through, but they are just a little bit rangier and they're not quite your kind of massive pillars of men they're not not an, not an Evan Etzebeth among them you know yeah, so that, in terms of that so it's they're very good ball players but that's the, the point of difference that La Rochelle will have is just weight and heft in that area and they'll look to try and do that and to put the squeeze on in the set piece that involves some drop balls as well like you know you got to, the pressure defence has got to create those if Leinster start dropping balls and then you can get the squeeze on at scrum time and then you can turn those penalties and turn it into a slow paced game a kind of game with the mm. ball in, in play only only when you want it to be yeah. and only on your terms you certainly but, don't want a repeat of what Leinster managed to do to Toulouse which I think the ball in play time was like 40 minutes Yeah, correct. the average one in the top tours which I think it was actually Hugo Mollo was citing that in his post-match interview for mm. uh, was saying that the average time in the top tours was around 30-32 minutes which is pretty high a lot in some contexts but uh, 40 minutes is just very very tough to live with if you allow Leinster to set that tempo that's yeah, probably no, going to be due and especially if you've, if you've the weight of your pack so yeah absolutely penalties slowing it down 
trusting your offensive mall because there have been chinks in what Leinster are doing but and not and over because yeah. they're like oh, yeah, oh, they're kick, their place kicking is going to have to be improved anyway it's a cup final all yeah, points yeah, matter yeah. but like maybe if they're on the angle or something just go to the corner and trust your mall and go after them and work an easier I think so yeah I think so I think the mall is a potential a real potential into them for them looking at what happened to, um, against Leicester just not overplaying your hand if Leinster's goal line defence is resilient you will yeah. need to, to, take, to, to take threes and chink at the scoreline true um, but yeah the, the, there is a blueprint there for, for La Rochelle there are things to work with yep. they will be looking strong um, they will be looking deep, deeply at all of the, at all of those options in terms of ways to break Leinster down they'll and also have a they'll also be for them. kind of looking back at them last year and obviously it's a different look, different challenge that Leinster will face this year but they're in Marseille they're, in, they're on French soil they beat this team by nine points last time they played them so you yeah. know, let's go no reason for them to not be confident going in um, um, yeah and the, the, the dynamics for La Rochelle finding a way to beat Leinster the dynamics for Leinster are slightly different in that you know the game plan is out in the open there's, there's, there's no mystery to it it's just it's it's got that sort of all black vibe of, of come and beat us if you can yeah like that, that's, well the other thing they'll, they'll, they'll cite well, obviously they've, they, I've heard a few interviews with a few of the lads and they have been citing the La Rochelle game last year and the Saracens defeat mm-hmm. in the final the year before um, but the one that would actually worry me more although they actually won the game was when they got that fourth star and it was against uh, against Racing because that was a, a, a year again where they looked looked the best team they did, and they ultimately they did win the final but in the final they did not play their game they actually yeah. played played a scrappy game against a team that were able for it and ended up having to rely on one or two kicks to get over the line I don't think I would like to see a repeat of that especially against this team that beat them last year La Rochelle I would, like for Leinster the, the trappings are to tighten up that little bit in cup final mm-hmm. mode and then you're suddenly you're actually I'm playing to true. playing to I mean, marching to the wrong tune. When, when the, the the A the A team have been playing um, the main guys, it's been all kind of blowout victories. It's yeah. been all just getting on top of the team. We haven't seen them getting behind into yet. Yes, that's no, true. No, apart from well, apart from France, against and Toulouse, and, actually briefly when they did throw yeah, that thing. Yeah, indeed, and they um, and they reacted they, very well to that. But they, they were just did. dominating that game from minute one. And that's been the story. I mean, they have been so dominant in all of their performances. We haven't really seen what it looks like for this team to be out of sorts and for it to be scrappy. I think the closest was probably the away game in the sports ground, which is obviously yes. played at a lower level. And that's true. Um, but yeah. what that was, that was a scrap. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, they were able to get enough done on the offense, and that would be the hope. Um, but I mean, they want like I would assume they want to play their game. They're yeah. they're brilliant uh, offense. Yes, it's that got them this far. Yeah. Why would you want to deviate from it? That's, yeah, the, um, the only concern you'd have would be the potential for the jackal threats to scupper them. The potential yeah. for like Toulouse in in one or two moments got the best of Leinster. Like one or two moments, they got the read on the pullback pass. Mm-hmm. Leinster don't want to telegraph that. They want to keep their 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 options as sharp as they can be. And they never look as sharp as when they're in the Aviva Stadium. That, that much is that for sure. Much is true, and um, they aren't there in Marseille, so that's so, going to yeah. be going to be a point so of difference. It, yeah, are they going to tighten up and focus a little bit more on ball protection and put maybe one or two forwards into into most rooks, and then just sacrifice an option to do that? And how much does that change the dynamics of what they're trying to do vis a vis? occupying the defence yeah. that's a question it remains to be seen it depends yeah. how effective La Rochelle are at the read at the tackle and then at the breakdown which yeah. which they're all going to be like they know they're going to come at them in those areas so yeah. it depends how if the deception of of what they're doing and if they can be accurate with it is enough to just do what they did like what like what they did to Toulouse I don't don't expect that they're expecting a challenge like what Toulouse game because I think even Sexton was citing it like that I felt like Munster did them a favour did half the work for them in that game because it felt like they were in championship mode and they know Toulouse and they, they they didn't feel like that was no. that was quite them at their A game whereas this La Rochelle side you'd expect especially after a skull three performance in the semi you'd expect them to come out galvanised well, not to final. mention two defeats in finals last yeah. year I mean, yeah, that really, that's going to be yeah, like yeah, yeah. A, a as much as Leinster pick. have boned big with the with the defeat to La Rochelle last year to for Ronan O'Gara like to have been in two finals already as a head coach and, and to be staring down the barrel of a third one where he might go zero and three in finals and start true. Posit- true. getting a positively Clermont record yeah, and that yeah. that's something that they'd be desperate to avoid. So I think we have to expect them at their best, them at their most uh, physical for, for and dynamic. Um, and that's the the intrigue is is how they're going to get after Leinster and how Leinster can exploit it. I mean. 
the, 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 the beautiful thing about how we've been playing at the moment is that the, the multiple options can make fools of teams trying to make a read t- trying True. to make a read True. trying um, to get the to be read fair, on like, um, okay, yeah, kicking it to DuPont notwithstanding Le- this Leinster side do work the short side very very well even yeah. when, they're, when they're numbered up on the outside and so being deceptive with that and kind of isolating teams try and force them to make folding decisions should I fold or should I not fold and then paralysing the forwards who are want to be jackling but they don't really know where the ball is exactly. yeah, that's a, exactly the level of dis, like get just subterfuge and distraction that this Leinster offence yeah, is built on and what, um, what Sexton and Gibson Park have been so good at doing is getting like a, a particularly Sexton I mean it's hard to put your finger on why apart from just sort of the aggressive personality and the sort of veteran smarts that he has but nobody is in shape at as quickly when he's not on the field it's true. and it's like as soon as Ross Byrne comes on everybody just slows down a little bit I think it was actually so, I think into, it was like a compliment shape. that Luke Fitzgerald who's a long time out of the game now or well, like quite a while out of the game but he's played with Sexton a fair bit and that was one of the big compliments he talked about was his spacing his ability to get the back line just spaced accurately and correctly yeah. it's, it's an un, unsung skill for every 10 to do a lot of the time but he's very very good at that and probably because of his shrill barking of orders yeah. probably not, he, it he, doesn't he, help in he any knows way. what he wants and he's the quarterback on the field and everyone else's job is to get where Sexton wants them to be yes, and, and yep. present them with the ball but the speed at which they fold is the undoing of, of the jackal threat yep. it's like it's the question of whether or not they win a contact there's an instant clean out Gibson Park's there instantly and, and as soon as he that. picks it up the shape is there yep. and all of a sudden then La Rochelle are chasing shadows they don't really know where to go and then when you do do what you know I said they should do and shoot up on Sexton if the timing on that is just slightly off Sexton's going to dump it off to his outside option number one who's going to run right in the space you left behind they're yeah. going to get that one runner in there straight back into shape again and be going again you'll be chasing shadows yeah. that's the kind of that's the glory of what Leinster are doing with the ball again at the moment it's and that's exactly, what they're going to be trying exactly to exactly what I hope to um, see as well yeah. um, yes obviously challenges forthcoming in the scrum and they'll want their line out darts to be accurate which towards the tail end of this season they have tied it up they had some issues on their own ball but they've yeah. actually tied it up it's, statistically it's, it's on the line out as well undoubtedly um, an area that let that La Rochelle are going to come oh, at them because La Rochelle are thinking how we could f- like Leinster's offence and defence is, is excellent but we could flip the script on them by taking both of their set pieces away Indeed, um, and that's going to be like a huge point of focus for Leinster in terms of just getting what they're doing right in the scrum like they, they was, there were weird moments against Toulouse like they were out of sync with one another there was one penalty that was given away immediately after Al Altoa came on the field and Cyril Bai got a penalty against him but it was actually it was Andrew Porter's fault because he tried to be really aggressive uh, on, on, on his man Aldegheri and he, he went for like sort of an extra push to try and, and get after Aldegheri Aldegheri is like rock solid he just wasn't wasn't going to be moved from his kind of set square position but he could take a step backwards but what Porter ended up doing was shifting the whole scrum a little bit to the left Onto and just putting putting both Cyril Bai and Julian Marchand right onto Ar- Alatoa and Alatoa just went backwards at the rate of knots just the pressure just couldn't cope with ended up buckling penalty to loose and that was actually where one of their few scores came from True. was just an error from Andrew Porter so like little moments like that like that's just like that cheap that's, points for, but that's for, that's like naive it's like what are we actually trying to do here like well, why why is Porter having a, having a dig there when it's not really on mm-hmm. they need to be 100% in sync with one another they and do. the mission statement for this Leinster team that backs themselves in open play is not to go hunt and scrum penalties it's to secure a solid secure your own ball scrum, secure your own ball low, contain strong. the La Rochelle yeah. scrum that's going to come after them and yeah. secure your own ball in and out also pressure their line out because James Ryan has, has been nicking a few as has Ross Maloney and big, they're, big, they're athletic get yeah, up there yeah. and pressure their big line out on the defensive that. end and um, create turnovers because like La Rochelle their KBA approach which they won't abandon entirely uh, they, you saw the folly of it sometimes in that uh, in that semi-final in terms of how loose they are Leinster in transition are very dangerous they, mm. they can put them under those kinds of that kind of pressure and force uh, speculative offloads from them or, or balls to deck uh, target the ball in contact as well because they're looking for that offload just big swimming arm Let try and generate some chaos that. ball and turn it over they yeah. did it to Toulouse a few times and it generates good scores for them because they, they'll feel confident in their ability to fold into shape on transition and yeah, they have I, great backfield I, strike runners if, um, if, if Leinster can get up and hard on the inside at, on, on the on the La Rochelle carriers the, the sort of the initial pot of forwards and disrupt them and consistently um, stop them at source in that area as in just don't go backwards at a rate of knots if, if Doris and, and, and Josh and co are coming up wrapping the ball 
just slowing everything up and getting a decent tackle off. I don't actually think that La Rochelle have the firepower in terms of first phase strike moves or just the, the quality of sort of like Ehia West doesn't really have the magic to unpick a defense with like a really wide killer pass. And they're missing it takes, the halfback to it takes phases. Yeah. Well, Red here is a solid Red here is a good halfback. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It, but it, it just, it'll take phases. It'll take phases and consistent momentum to get La Rochelle to actually threaten the Leinster defense. So if they can scupper them on the inside, I don't see La Rochelle having too much in the way of, of, of the killer offense to actually unstick Leinster on the edge I think they have to win it on the inside and hence that's where Leinster really have to win it as well on the defensive end they've been great at bringing pressure they've, they've, they've forced offloads even the likes of Cyril Bai who sits down one or two men every time wasn't getting too much purchase and if you can if you can rein that guy in you okay. can rein what uh, what La Rochelle are bringing in as well but it was it it's was true. an opus performance from the Leinster defense against Toulouse it will need to be similar yeah, yes this, this is it there's no, no if, it, if it's diminished um, at all that's when you invite invite the big yeah. French side in on French soil but uh, yeah that is forthcoming this not this weekend next weekend in uh, Montpellier that's the velodrome the Stade Velodrome in Marseille I should say um, referee is going to be Monsieur Barnes yes, for this one the only, the only Englishman at the bottom great call as well Indeed, no, no um, problem with it at all um, yeah excited to see him take the, take this actually I've kind of yeah, haven't seen him as much uh, with, the, with the whistle these days um, but yeah he's going to be taking this it's going to be box office it's it's Ireland v France it's Leinster v La Rochelle it's Rod v, 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 v Leinster v yeah. Sexton as well it's um, got all kinds of colour to it Leinster are favourites going in and they're certainly our favourites as well but do not well, write I, off the French team. How do, are you seeing it going? What's your what's your call? Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean with the favourites tag and say that Leinster get it done. And, and get what kind of game are you picturing? I'm picturing a little tight at uh, at times. I think I think La Rochelle will cause us some problems. I think we we might be a little inaccurate in in certain sequences. We might try and force the pass once or twice. But I do think we will find scores. And I think our actually our defence will probably be telling in terms of. I don't think La Rochelle will find quite as many. I think I think there'll be one or two tries, if maybe they, even they three tries for Leinster and if one La, or possibly two for La Rochelle. Yeah, if, if the La Rochelle tries come, they'll come from penalties. Yeah. Then kicks to the corner. Yeah. Then pressure. Then physicality. No, what'll worry What'll over. worry me is yeah. if it's a stop start game that's kind of three six and three all three all six all six all. Mm. Then you're in a scrappy cup final and anything could happen. But yeah. uh, if Leinster managed to set the tempo, if I think they, we win. they keep playing their game. That was what they did against all of these teams in Connacht in the sports ground when they were under pressure they just kept stuck to their rhythms and eventually a defensive cog was misplaced on the opposition end and in they in they ran yeah. in ran someone like James Lowe who'll finish once they get the line breaks I think they're dangerous enough yes yeah, so I think that's probably a better bet because you're not um, getting odds on Leinster at all but James Lowe to score a try I don't know if you're going to get much <laughs> odds on that either because he's, he's been doing it every game yeah yeah <laughs> I mean yeah that's that's the key Leinster if they can just stick to that offense and keep playing their game and not not recede into crazy cup final mode and make it a make it a, a, a flip of a coin they should have enough even against a very impressive game Wiley La Rochelle yeah. team I think Leinster another, should another, have another factor this in this is obviously there's there's a week of, of domestic action beforehand and La Rochelle unlike Leinster Leinster's B yeah. team managed to go to South Africa and secure top spots so they can rest mm. they have a game against Munster but they will not send any of their championship starters out whereas yeah. La Rochelle are right on the precipice of the barrage so those guys whoever is although they are with mm. a few injuries and to be fair both teams are with a few injuries you don't get to a cup final in a campaign like this without a few injuries That your squad yeah. needs to carry carry it through but yeah La Rochelle will have a, a, a very competitive game this weekend coming and then have to get up that, for that, that, that is always a dynamic it is the, the French team they did have a win in Europe last year they, they were routine, they were routinely dynamic. performed Apart from Toulouse well. are top yeah. of the table and in cup I mean, finals you know and doing doubles real. Like, um, the French teams are dominating Europe just it's French teams and Leinster I mean like it, they are like they're managing they're coping with that workload really well that's I mean, true. It's, it's nothing it's nothing new for them and no. I don't expect them to be diminished truly for it no, no. any major injuries but I do think yeah if I'm predicting the game I'm, I'm hoping to see Leinster's offence that has been so good this year that's going to rock up in green to New Zealand and hope to hope to win on, on, on New Zealand's soil against the All Blacks this summer and if you want to be doing that you want to be you know, maintaining that 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 excellent standard that they've set for themselves, you should be able to unstick this good but not 
world class La Rochelle defence on enough occasions to get enough scores to win the game to hopefully claim a fifth star I, I anyway, would agree with all of that so I, yes I, I'm going to be there I'm going to be he's down be there in Marseille yep, 445 in the Stade Velodrome he's going to be there in Marseille uh, a few other family I'm not I'm going to be working annoyingly but uh, yeah, yeah no I'm going to still be watching it um, where are you going to be watching it from let us know in the comments down below and who you got are you fancying a, a, a punt against the curve and going for La Rochelle on the upset or are you going going with the the, the masses and with ourselves and saying Leinster are going to get that fifth star let us know down below in the comments but uh, with that yeah I think we are going to move on absolutely yes we're going to do our due diligence now and take a look at the second tier competition in Europe which is of course the Challenge Cup um, which has been running parallel to the knockout stages of of course the main event the Champions Cup but there have been some good games in that that we're going to uh, reflect on um, we of course had the quarter finals um, yes. first up um, they, they didn't do the last 16 in the, in the Challenge Cup. They had an extra round of pools, um, pool matches during those weeks. Um, so we had Gloucester facing off against Saracens at, in King's Home. Um, it was beautiful performance by Saracens, really, back to their best. Um, 44-15, just, wasn't it? A nice yeah, Leary yeah. Samet try in the, mid, in the mix of it all, but uh, but that was kind of powerless to stop the Saris tide that was coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, good good no, no, nugget on, on, on Louis Rees Samet. He'd scored six in eight games since being dropped by Wales. There you um, go. So actually, yeah, yeah. the ball is bouncing for him a little bit, and he scored a lovely try in that game. So it'd be nice to see him torn to South Africa and potentially True getting back enough. some form yeah, but, in due uh, Course, it but was, it was it was a tale of Saracens being very good, getting that rhythmic offense going. Some lovely touches from Faz and Alex Good, and, yeah, and just some joyous Dave, play. Davies drove drove a nice tempo as well, and just they kind of had their way with Gloucester throughout that one. So that was an easy win on the Friday night uh, of that weekend. Then a much more tense affair in the second one. Uh, Edinburgh thirty, Wasps thirty four, uh, stealing it right at the death. That kind of toed and froed a bit towards the tail end of the second half. It was a really fun game actually. There was a lot of offensive footy from both sides. Um, yeah, the two. Georgians pulled out the stops uh, for 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 uh, for in this one for as well. Leon, yeah, for Leon. No, um, or sorry, that was Leon Glasgow. I was talking about. Sorry, I was, uh, the the Edinburgh Wasps one. Before we move on from that, was uh, was just a heartbreak for Edinburgh. Um, I had I had to have to mention that it was it was they were so close. They were so close, and uh, they really did deserve it. And they've actually played a great season, in Edinburgh. But uh, Wasps did manage to dig it out just at the end. And fair play to them. They managed to get get through to a semi final and keep that flying. But no, the Leon game that you were talking about, another home dinger on the. Saturday, another one involving the Scottish, the other Scottish faithful, Leon 35. Glasgow 27 yeah, so great close as well another great game yeah they very both, fun teams. they both came to, came yeah. to play they really did uh, Glasgow gave it everything but Leon just had that little bit of extra quality in the in the very end yeah, and yeah I like mean, no, no, no less than those two Georgians I saw that's before. right yeah though just Saganadza and Nini Ashvili both starting and both. contributing fantastic performances uh, for Leon in that game Saganadza had a try chalked off where he marauded his way through a few Glas Glaswegians to score and unfortunately a knock on at, at a break down a couple of phases before uh, was TMO checked and ended up chalking it off but it was a monstrous score nonetheless and he was uh, everyone was yeah. convinced it was li it was live football footy at the time and he scored a great one but he was monstrous all over the pitch and then Nini Ashvili looks a special player like I mean as much as uh, Beck as uh, as uh, Gorgadza uh, Godzilla the Great is remembered with such fondness and was such a top player from Georgia I think Nini Ashvili He's he's still young. He's still twenty. Yeah. Um, but he, he's a he different looks, kind of George. He looks like next he's gonna, generation. He has the same toughness, he, but he's he's a flyer. He, he looks like he might be the best ever Georgian player if he continues on his track record. He's a, he's a he's a star. He's yeah. a real star. He, really he gets is. the ball. He's got he's got tremendous X factor. He's got he reads the game so well. He's tough on the, both the offense and defensive side. And then he's also just a lethal lethal finisher yeah. so and scored a won. nice couple of tries. A brace for Leon in that game. Absolutely. Um, a tremendously fun ding dong battle. It was throughout. It was. Um, it was a little bit more daylight. It wasn't quite the grandstand finish uh, in the end that the that the Edinburgh uh, game had provided. But it was. It was oh, still a lot of fun. Still a lot of fun. Probably a bit more box office as a game. And then the final quarter final, Toulon edged past London Irish nineteen eighteen. But for a Miss Paddy Jackson kick at the very death from a Wonder try from the Wonder kid Harry Ar Arundel, who just decided he was going to skin all of Toulon on his way to the try line with yeah. a couple of lovely little swirls at the end he's an absolute superstar actually he's been lining out 15 for them and he looks really really good young uh, talent player, another yeah, young, good young squad. talent in the England squad as well 
but it wasn't to be for London Irish. They're very they're getting involved in very uh, very exciting games this season. Ding dong battles and one score games, plenty of draws as well. But uh, you know they were just pipped by Toulon. They could have it was a touchline conversion away from them, but Toulon did just enough. Uh, to it see it them reminded off. me of the um, of the Toulon game a few years back against Munster in the in the Champions Cup, the main event. It was also a quarter final. Um, uh, also, um, it, well, actually that one was away from home in Thon Park. But they had the beatings of Munster. They were a better team than Munster that year, and they they completely fell asleep off an exit kick, missed touch, and Andrew Conway That's danced right. in with five minutes to go and scored what was a wonder try against them. And Munster, of course, not having Paddy Jackson in the team, converted the try That's and uh, and, yeah. and ended up winning the game. Um, and it, it felt like a carbon copy of that. Like it was a sensational score by oh, Henry Arundel. Yeah, yeah. He he slid, cut through cut through from his own half, cut a brilliant line, and then and then did the double swerve to beat the last two defenders. Yeah. And it was just it was pinpoint beautiful, one of the great individual tries of the season. And, and it was and also yeah. also horrific defending. Oh, it switched off completely too long, from too long. long. I think with Sarah five minutes to go. But everyone was ball watching oh, while he like took the, flight, and then he got up to top speed, and then the two long lads are like, maybe I'll jog, and yeah, then it's like, no, I'm not going to be the, enough. The, the last two defenders, the winger and fullback, I mean, they were both actually had the pace to cover him, and they were both checked their run when he did the little shimmy, the second shimmy to to dart inside and then go back outside. When one like if they just held their composure and and communicated a little, one guy take inside, one guy take outside, they shut down they that should. try. But they and just one didn't. of them gets the poach. I know. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's a lingering concern about Toulon that that just occasionally they just fall asleep. They and, do. Uh, they, they do. They did they, in that they, moment. They did have the beatings uh, of London. They, they, um, for the record, they were the better side, but London Irish were the more excited, probably the more wor- more worthy side because they were. It was like watching a a better side just kind of haphazardly go through the motions and get the win quarterfinals footy um, but Toulon did go marching on from that and commiserations to London Irish so from there yes eight went into four and then we had the semi-final lineup um, and yeah it was it was both of them were Anglo-Franco clashes uh, right, in, in yeah, either yeah. side uh, first up on Friday night was Leon hosting Wasps and that was a very tense game uh, 20 points to yeah. 18 it finished we had our grandstand finish because Wasps scored a late try to create that but uh, yeah Leo Burdu from 10 his 15 point haul was just enough to sink Wasps hopes of getting their first European silverware since I think it's 12 years uh, I think it's 15 years now actually yeah we have that, uh, that 2007 they would have won seven. the European Cup the that's main, right the they, have, they have two stars in their jersey Wasps they do have Europe European pedigree, but uh, it was just a bridge too far away from away from home in France. Um, it was a very tense the, first half. They were won, they won the first half. Robson grabbed the opening score. Gopperth was adding kicks to it. It was the game was kind of broken open by a beautiful sequence of play that led to Birdo's try just on forty seven yeah. minutes or so, just after the half that uh, allowed them to respond. And then they, I think that they, they, Wasps briefly retook the lead with a Gopperth penalty, but then another pick and yeah. a very physical try this time came from Leon to stretch it out to a twenty points to a. I think at that point and uh, yeah that was just a kind of that was where the game went it, it lingered at that for a while tons of drop balls from Wasps in that period mm-hmm. when they were when they were chasing the game it was like a bewildering display of crazy drops it was coming off yeah. the shoulder coming off the face coming off everywhere and going everywhere and it was like oh no Wasps calm down and uh, they did they did manage to grab a try just towards the death to set up the grandstand finish but it was it was actually Leon who ended with a bit of composure I, yeah, I, it, Leon yeah. were a better team it was a surprise yeah. to see Wasps leading it and doing as well as they did in that first half it was kind of a throwback to when that year a couple of years back when they made the Premiership final yeah. um, with Jack Willis back in the team and him partnered with Barbieri they had a real high quality breakdown press Presence, yeah, um, which is definitely a positive from 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 their point of yeah, view. Yeah, going and getting back to, to and getting to involved in that Premiership um, as well. Like we know that one or two good jacklers in a team can do all kinds of damage out there in in, in the Premiership as well. Yeah, and so it, yeah, it, no. it, was, it was pleasing in that sense. But at the same time, I thought Leon were the better team. I and do. once they turned it on, they were they were just that. Bit that was that was the feeling. Was never that, that, try, that, that sequence um, that led to that beautiful Burdu try that that began with a kick return in their own half and just ended up with him gliding in with lovely look, going through many sets of hands that was kind of the sign of them just clicking enough mm. to, to see off Wasps ultimately it's, it's the understated but top class halfback combination of the top tours Burdu yeah. and Kuyu yeah. um, together very lovely tempo very yeah. wise players get the offence really rumbling it's true. you don't see much written about them but they're high high quality high class Not players sure. Kuyu went on that Australia tour and was absolutely brilliant true. for France so you know he has pedigree at that test level as well 
but uh, yeah Burdu 15 points lovely off the tee as well um, yeah just just did enough to, to get past Wasps although a very good challenge was put forward by Wasps very creditable in defeat um, the other semi-final was a replay of a Champions Cup final there were yeah. more stars on show in this than there were in one of the semi-finals in the main show in terms of Toulon versus Saris two, two European giants uh, going toe-to-toe in the Challenge Cup Toulon were the hosts um, Saris might have been slight favourites just given the form going in but it was Toulon who hit the ground running and who looked the better side throughout this game. And they really did. They, yeah. like, they, they all came to play. Etzebeth had a huge game. Now, Atoji had a big game too. But I think the, the difference then was that Olivon also had a huge game in those spoiling mo- moments and actually got, got on top of the Saris mall. Saris did go to the corner multiple times but couldn't get anything off because of the quality of Toulon's defense. And then on the offensive side... Oh God, Villiers on one wing, two tries for the man, two glorious tries as well, beautiful sequences. And on the other wing, Wynacola with a, a beautiful, silky oh, individual so, try to ice so the game good. and a few other lovely, lovely yeah. touches. Just really, really good danger out there. Villiers as well, like he grabbed that try just before half time. That was so huge with all the back row combining as well. It was Parise yeah. to Olivon, out to Dupria and then out to Villiers. It was just the back row in concert. Um, that was a lovely score and then immediately after half time before Saris could exit on you know, around 47 minutes Villiers in over the ball immovable penalty jackal three points yeah. and then it's like a 10 it's point, 10 point swing and on, was, in, in the defense was the big thing like it it was the huge. fact that yeah. the Saracens and their lovely rhythmic beautifully structured offense couldn't get it couldn't off because they couldn't dominate physically. physically and the try they got was against yeah. the run of play. Ben yeah. Earl charged down completely yeah. against the run of play um, just got them into the game ill divert that was in the first half and then they suddenly took the lead and it was one of those like geez we're in the lead don't know how don't yeah. know why but we're in the lead because we've been completely outplayed yeah. like Billy, Billy V had a good game but they were they were a little shocked by the physicality and the stuff that Etzebeth was doing just the, the monstrous contacts that he was coming up with was just so big and Etzebeth in particular seems to have been sparked into a bit of life uh, by, by Baki's Boats' point, pointed comments That's and he's probably going to bring them some silverware the before he leaves of a, of a trophy. Um, like they, they, we uh, were saying they were very poor and very kind of sluggish in the quarter final but as mm. soon as semi-finals roll in and you're in the game then it's like suddenly there's a trophy on the line and suddenly you can play they're, they're a, a, a big game team game. and the Saracens yeah. were found out a little and we, we talk about we spoke at her earlier in the show and it's a consistent theme the premiership team's just not used to pressure defenses no. And, and that, that, that it was it consistently was, it finding was true Lev. for Leicester um, when they faced Leinster it was as yeah. true for Saris here when they met um, again Toulon who were ready to disrupt them yeah. at every call high, high um, class game though belonged, really it was. belonged in the Champions it did. Cup it um, looked, a, yeah, it looked yeah. a cut above everything else in this tournament yeah. being, as is the calibre of these teams um, there were a few key kind of things actually Ben Earl he did grab that try had a few pivotal drops in the second half. Sarri's right. turn, they were, it was a two-score game for a long period in the final quarter. Owen Farrell kept turning down threes. There were like three different penalties they got that were kickable. That they kicked them all madness. to the corner and were repelled One even with, single with a few minutes to go. Yeah. And this was to kick it to make it a six-point game. Yeah. I, I'll never understand that. Like Pepeep, that Even t- teams that take threes when I don't want them to take threes will all of a sudden turn them down when it's a 10-point game, almost like, well, we have to get the try now. No, you don't. Yeah. Get to, get it back to a score. Give yourself a chance yeah. to build a try. I mean, it's you're just, never look at look at what yeah. Toulouse did. They managed to steal steal extra time, and then they won it on yeah, penalties. Yeah, you know? exactly. like, you just yeah, yeah, give, give yourself a chance. If yeah. you go huffing and puffing at the line for ages and eat up all the clock, and I, just don't, I just don't and think then that's annoy the yourselves as well. There were a few um, loose passes at one point. I think Faz was screaming abuse at his halfback, uh, Davies, for a yeah. loose pass at one point that killed one of those offensive drives oh, well, um, he didn't captain too well fast no. and he's been in top form but he, he, has. he, he didn't he didn't he didn't like what he was what he was no, getting he didn't and, and day. Ben Earl was the one other one I mentioned because like he, he is great in moments but he switches off at moments and there yeah. were a few cheap turnovers through him in very pivotal moments but those are the degrees with it actually Saris will have no complaints like they're, they're top side and they're top top caliber club it was a one score game it was it was a one score game just about before the final quarter before Wynacolo struck with that try that just blew it out to that yeah. two score game and forced those kind of panic decisions from the Saris men but it was a game that they didn't deserve to win and Toulon with the home crowd it was great to see that Felix Mayall in such song and in such colour the sun was shining it was a beautiful day they had Pilu uh, Pilu new, new, new cast but still the same yeah, effect yeah. it was absolutely great pre-match pageantry and as you say probably did belong at uh, at the top table yeah. and if well based on this season's tables 
uh, they'll both be at uh, in the main show next year and that'll be like, yeah. you know, it'll be an even tougher task for it and, and but only one can go on in this that leaves the final and it's Toulon Toulon go marching on for this year and they meet Lyon in the final also in the Stade Velodrome in Marseille um, this Friday or uh, Friday May um, 27th so the Friday before the Saturday where the main show yeah, is yeah. as is normal um, yeah there was talk it could have been an all French final in the main show but here is your, the all French final so hopefully a good turnout for it on the Friday night as well bit of silverware would mean a lot to both of these clubs Lyon and Toulon have been really good for the last few seasons um, but haven't really had anything to show for it in terms of silverware so this is this is a nice yeah. one once you're and in a final you're there to win it yeah and it's a fun one as well because it's a it's like Lyon is a bit away from Marseille but yeah. not too far no, it's, it's a little not, bit it's north not, it's not like and heading up to, to Toulon is right next to it yeah. Too long, too long, so it's a it's a derby like it's, it's a it's, day it's, trip it's, and a and a rugby game and a cup right. final it's, and it's, hopefully a trophy I would expect for both these teams. A big atmosphere with lots of yeah. fans for both teams, lots of color. It's going to be a very fun game. I'm obviously I'm pulling for Leon. I like Leon. They're a lot of fun. Um, You're hoping for that Georgian duo of Saganza yeah, and Indianashvili to just have their way and link with the Taufi Fanuas of the of the, the yeah, pack as I mean, well. There's some big, big meaty forwards going at each other for both teams. But yeah, Saganadza and some of these guys are going to have to have a huge game on the inside. And then excited to, to hopefully see Ninyashvili get some better ball than he did against Wasps in that semi final when they, they they were running sort of errant patterns for a lot of that first half and he wasn't getting the right ball. Also, um, but, as you you highlighted, Kuyu, but uh, Saran for Toulon as well too top level halfbacks as is always yeah. the way whether you're looking at an all French final top quality halfbacks on display with Baptiste Saran and uh, and Kuyu as well so that'll be it'll be an, an interesting one to see who gets the front football from yeah will the likes of Etzebeth be monstering through Taufi Fanuas or will Olivon be able to have his way with Saganadza will they cancel each other out will will Parise who's been drinking the fountain of youth stuff he's been getting those offloads away he's been struggling with the physicality at times can, can he manage to dial it in for one more cup final and get some silver as well there's all kinds of narratives with it because they are such colourful good teams but they're really good teams to watch they play the yeah. game in actually quite a quite an engaging manner they, they control themselves very well they are quite physical but they can both take a try if they're, if they're cheap with possession a cheap turnover mm-hmm. and expect both of them to transition very well yeah, yeah it's exciting absolutely and uh, how do you see it going yeah I'm, I'm up in the air with it to be honest I, I'm, I'm, it's a toss of a coin I think Toulon are probably the form side um, mm-hmm. in terms of just looking at their top tours form as well um, and neither of them have completely signed, sealed, delivered their place in the barrage Leon are, are in the barrage at the moment Toulon are still outside of it because of their bad start to the season but in terms of the form guide Toulon have been winning games for fun at the minute so it's tough to see past them oh. Jeez, I'm, I'm, I'm flip of a coin, bounce of a ball. <laughs> um, maybe Toulon with the Villiers factor, I probably have just ahead in my, my estimations because yeah. that guy is is super impressive. Every time I see him take the field, he's just yeah. he's part groundhog, part winger. He is a, yeah. he's a super player, Villiers, there's no doubt about it. Um, I must say, I I, um, I think I agree. I think Toulon, um, they have the European pedigree, they have the big game pedigree, the cup final pedigree, and I'm going to say just even, more than, even than the Villiers factor, it's the Etzebeth factor. The Etzebeth factor. That's, that that yeah. guy is just a, a monstrous player, and he's so big in cup finals. Yeah. I, I'm totally pulling for Leon for my, my Georgian comrades. You know, we, it's a long established love of Georgia that I've expressed on this podcast. True, and yeah. to see two players playing in a, in a European final of this magnitude from the Georgian national team is really really exciting. So I'm, yeah. I'm definitely delighted to see how they go. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, I think Toulon. Yeah. With the sort of the right, right next to really, it's a home game. Really in Marseille, it's so close to them, and uh, I just think. They are a big game team. Their and fans I, will definitely travel as well. There'll, yeah. there'll be a Toulon uh, voice there. Yeah, they're yeah. a big game team in a way that I'm not sure that Leon are. So I think I, I, I back them just. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think Toulon as well. Who have you got? Or where, where are you going to be watching it from? You were saying you might go down to the game. I where where the Georgian jersey and yeah. go down in. Um, yeah, to Friday night in France. Two French teams, two class teams. Um, always a good curtain raiser. Normally a bit more of an open game than uh, than what the Champions Cup final There's as well. There's been some ends great up. Champions Cup finals. There have been yeah, yeah. some absolutely phenomenal games in this uh, in this fixture before, and I expect this will just d- deliver on that as well. So uh, yeah, let us know who you got in the comments down below. Absolutely. Um, yes, and with that, we are going to move on and just take a look at some of the other rugby that's been going on around Europe. And we're going to start with the new competition, uh, the Rugby, rugby Europe, Europe Super, Super Cup, Cup. That's right, which uh, wrapped up after its first season. Uh, it was uh, there were two semi-finals. The Lusitanos of Portugal managed to put forty-two points on the Tel Aviv Heat, 
um, and uh, they won that game 42-26. to In the other semi-final, a humdinger of a game played out in, T- in Tbilisi between the Black Lion of Georgia and the Castilla y Leon Iberians uh, of Spain. The Black Lion taking it 43 points to 40 in a great ding-dong battle that constantly ebbed and flowed. Um, and then the final was played in, Lib- in Lisbon and was a much tighter affair, a 17-14 to 14 Finals, win 40, you know, for, the, for the Georgians. As, yes. as is often the case um, when there's a tournament with Rugby Europe involved, the Georgian team has just was, emerged on yeah, top. Yeah, back-to-back three-point wins. Obviously, they, they don't have many of their internationals because they're, um, they're, they're, playing, uh, they're playing their trade in France. But they do have um, Challenge Cup finals yeah, and such. They, they do have Tabat Sadza and they do have um, they, Tabat Sadza, the great winger, who yeah. was a high-flying scorer for them in in rugby Europe and they do have uh, Sharik Adza leading them in spirit grabbing key tries but it was it was the forward pack that got them home against uh, against uh, the Lusitanos just stealing a, a, bi- a big try towards the tail end of the game from the red zone yeah. although Lishiske was lamenting the refereeing after the game Lishiske taking the uh, Lusitanos but nevertheless encouraging for them and we will touch on the uh, the rugby Europe situation a little later in the show towards the tail end about what's happened with Spain but uh, Legisque's job far from done oh, now, yeah. I'm very more. much back in the mix and preparing to try and make a charge for the World Cup so uh, good to see them being competitive with the Georgian team and I think overall the, the reflection on the tournament is just great to get one year in the books yeah, that's the main absolutely thing absolutely key um, with all of the it was the same thing we said when Slar uh, had its inaugural tournament a few years ago um, when the MLR mm. had its inaugural yeah. tournament as well um, you just want to see these these get a season done and even like new formats of also, Super Rugby you, you want to see them complete the season and get it in the books and there have been obstacles obviously the Russia yeah. situation has changed this thing they've had to rip yeah, they up need to get, they need to get new franchises they need to get um, new franchises yeah, yeah. there's a lot of off season work he's doing but there's one in the books there is a champion team there's Black yeah. Lion it's, it's also, there for history Bla- there's no Black Lion competitive in the in the Curry Cup second tier and yes, winning they- this competition with some established Georgian internationals I mean team there is no reason I can think of why they shouldn't be in the Challenge Cup next year and it's between Rugby Europe and the EPCR let's just get that done and it should be done by next year it's been great how quick the South African transition has happened True, uh, in, and they're going to be in Europe next year and, and even lift the Champions Cup to greater heights if that's possible possible um but um the 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 like the, i'd love to see uh, the black lion anasay stm the one of the russian teams that was in this tournament has played challenge cup rugby i remember connacht traveling out there to siberia yes. to play them black lion are a better team than they are or ever were True. i want black lion in the challenge cup let's get it done and yeah. let's have them play agree. the likes of cardiff and yeah. see what that's I would, like i would love to see that yeah, yeah, yeah let's you, go and do it you're telling okay. me they're going to be less valuable than zebra i don't think no. so i don't think yeah, so no, i don't think I, so either i think they will add value in yeah. and color in for, for to be honest i don't think i like the iberians and the lusitanos yeah, i'm not, I mean, a, not averse to having them all pathway, in the challenge cup that pathway yeah, to it will only bolster especially now with the precedent with south africa obviously i understand why south africa happens first it's tier one country it's a yeah. nation, but like you know that doesn't preclude these ideas well the, cha- the challenge cup is a great competition but it shouldn't just it shouldn't just be the dregs of the three main leagues yeah. now that you have this other professional league with the opportunity like professional franchises from portugal spain yeah. and uh, obviously it was russia but uh, it no longer is it's now israel is the is the other country but there's also the netherlands and belgium as well like a pathway for those countries that's what the challenge cup it should be about it should it's having it should. Those, and having it was before matchups. and it, yeah, it yeah. could be again even through these new formats no you're dead right you're dead right but mm. uh, but not to disparage or diminish from the rugby europe super cup which has played its inaugural season as we say the georgian side the black line are champions but credit creditable showings from the lusitanos and the castilla y leon uh, iberians as well and um, but yeah with that i think we're gonna just move on and briefly round up what's going on in the other domestic leagues across Europe as well because there are games coming up this weekend and it's getting into the business end to the point where there's only only two fixtures left in the regular season in the top couture's um, and yeah, like the, the it's it's a changeable scenario, you know. Like it's it there's a lot of volatility up at the top of the table with a lot of teams finding form late in the uh, late in the race. Montpellier still sit on top with sixty nine, but Bordeaux are on sixty seven behind them. Cast are also on sixty seven, just outside of the top two at the minute. But yeah. you know very very changeable up there Racing on 66 just a point behind so all of those teams could potentially make runs for the home the home spots and skip out on that barrage segment um, Leon are holding on on 63 with Toulouse on 62 those are the bottom two spots and just below them also on 62 are La Rochelle the uh, Champions Cup finalists 
but currently sitting outside of the uh, finals footy in the top couture's such as the competition and the high flying Toulon the other European finalists are three points further back on 59 they could conceivably with a couple of wins and a couple of results going their way narrow that gap and jump jump in uh, springboard even past Lyon or Toulouse but it's very very tight it's very very volatile up there and then at the bottom as well Perpignan are three That's points adrift of Breve so they could with with a, yeah, with a be, win uh, they, Beirits, did, they did get a win the last time they were out Perpignan they could Beirits are relegated up. and uh, they're at the bottom but that second to last place with the um, gets itself a playoff against the second placed team in the Pro Deux yeah. um, and Perpignan if, if they were to win would knock Breve Breve of the many Georgians who you always have to read for but actually not just Georgians they have a, a team chock-a-block full of tier 2 talent in test rugby it's true um, so they're always a lot of fun um, and I'm, I'm definitely rooting for Breve to stay up but I like Perpignan as well so hope that that's going to be an interesting dynamic to watch play out over the next two rounds Breve having Toulouse and uh, Perpignan having to travel to cast yes, um, this yeah. weekend it's entirely possible neither of them win but if, if either of them can can get a big a big result that would be uh, that would potentially, potentially save their save skins them. yeah yeah um, and uh, yeah the, the uh, teams on the precipice like Toulouse and La Rochelle and Clermont on Toulon one of which is going to moose out first of all on, on yeah. Europe even Lyon all of which if, if their focus yeah. shifts a little and they drop drop points in the two games Lyon are not completely safe on their 63 yeah. points even though they're fifth at the minute they're not safe from um, they're not safe from um, uh, uh, drug the top from holding on to from the top holding. six but yeah. the top eight for European qualification oh, yes. They're more or less okay, and they, they, they would take a quite a quite a turnaround of results to, to, to hurt them in that regard. But yes, the barrage uh, place is being signed over the next two week, weeks, so that's really exciting. The pick of the games this weekend: um, Montpellier hosting Racing is always a good one. Yeah. Um, La Rochelle Stad will be watched with interest by all Leinster fans ahead of next mm-hmm. week. And uh, yeah, uh, 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 obviously that big game between Breve and Toulouse. Um, Stad, they should it's be just fun. a crunch game between Breve and Toulouse at either end of the table. Yeah, both sides both, will be determined both have for a to win, win in a, in yeah, a certain yeah. way. That that'll be a fun one. Yeah, and Breve at home, which kind of you know levels the playing field a little bit. That uh, that could be an, an absolutely very fun game. Absolutely. So yeah, the top tours has been delivering. There's been a lot of really good action and a lot of top box office players as well but it's getting into that business end and then similarly in the URC which has been a great old tournament this year to be honest to replace the old Pro 16 or Pro 14 or any of that the URC has has already delivered in terms of that we're, we're a couple of weeks out and or sorry we are one week out the pic, the picture is still not completely firm on the last week of action it's great Leinster side Leinster's, Leinster did send out a youth side to South Africa and managed to garner two losing bonus points uh, which has secured them top spot so they're settled but Munster are currently sitting in uh, in second with 56 points which would be a home you know, uh, home path all the way, but they're only on fifty six points and only ahead on on points difference because Sharks also on fifty six, Stormers on fifty six, Ulster on fifty five, Bulls on fifty three. You know, if uh, Munster are playing Leinster this week, now granted mm. Leinster will rest a lot of players, but if they are to lose that game, they could be heading out to South Africa to play uh, play their their post post That's right. season. Uh, so. Likewise, Ulster Ulster hosting the Sharks this week. Yeah, if they beat the Sharks, um, obviously they'll be in a healthy position. And the Sharks will be the side on the precipice of travelling. Yeah, huge, in- hugely interesting dynamics in the URC. I just love how it's going down to the wire for once. And it's, it's great it's competition not just at the top year. there with that because like Glasgow and Edinburgh are both both on fifty points even and both in seventh and eighth, which are the bottom two spots of the playoffs. But only one of them's going to Europe. Which That's is right. that going to be? So it's an like eighteen seventy two cup with more stakes than you'd ever see. Indeed, um, the win- winning side plays in the Champions Cup, losing side does not, on account of how and that the one Welsh team qualifies. And that battle for the Welsh shield also has intrigue it because does. Ospreys and Scarlets are tied on points, forty four points down below, each down um, in what is it ninth and tenth outside of the playoff uh, reckoning. But yeah. it, with a fight for European rugby it's, next year, it's been thrilling. I think it's yeah. been I think it's been the best competition in Europe this year. And I'm always I like if you if you watch back some of the podcasts we've had in the past, I have been a down on on our domestic league from, yeah. from a Leinster fans fans point of view. I've I've been saying it's rubbish, the worst league in Europe. That's what I said the last few years. I flipped on a dime. I think the South African sides have brought such great energy to proceedings. Yeah, change the just, dynamic. Like you look at this last weekend. Um, uh, uh, obviously there's a couple of games that don't matter. Uh, Dragons, Lions, Connacht, Zebra, and Bennett and Cardiff. But yeah. every other game has huge stakes. Scarlet Stormers, both sides desperate for a win. Scarlet's wanting to make uh, Europe 
Stormers home the home advantage is such a huge but huge advantage for a South African team. You know, think of traveling to Ireland versus uh, an Irish team traveling down to South Africa. Yeah. Such a massive difference. Um, so the Stormers needing a win. Scarlets needing a win. Edinburgh, Glasgow, both sides need a win. Um, Ospreys, Bulls, both sides need a win. Yeah. Uh, it's just dramatic stuff. And Ulster Sharks on the Friday night. Obviously, it's just going to be a brilliant game as well. The Sharks having a re-summoned Lacanio Am. Yes. And brought they, him back yeah. from his trip down to to play some sweet rugby with Ben Smith of yeah, all people. Yeah. What a centre partnership that was in fun Japan. With his frosted tips for a while, but um, I, it was back that, for the business end. It, it, yeah, it's yeah. just been a very very compelling league, and there's lots of great games this weekend. I'm looking forward to to tucking in, and obviously we as Leinster fans in the beneficial position of watching it all unfold. Yes, thankfully with a game uh, in the Viva Stadium against Munster with uh, you know possibly the similar squad to the one that went to. South Africa playing in it with maybe one or two players that you want to give them right, to, yeah. but uh, but Pro- Monster desperate for a win, yeah. so they'll be gung ho to try and try and take on those those kids properly. Like, yeah, all of those games have such stakes, and I can't remember the last time that has happened in this league that we we'll get to the final weekend of the regular season before we even see any knockout. And there's there's this much kind of intrigue going on. Yeah, it's um, been brilliant. Yeah, no, it is. It has um, been fa- fantastic this year. And then the Premiership as well into the final few weeks or the final two weeks for the Premiership, and there's still some jostling to be done there as well. Um, Gloucester could yet have a say um, in terms of snaking oh, sure. in there. Yeah, um, it's probably point. probably a bridge too far for Exeter. Not not mathematically definite, but uh, it will be the first time in a few years that Exeter are to miss out on the uh, post season in this one. They s- currently sit in sixth and they're a bit they're a little bit adrift there they, they need a lot to go their way yeah well I mean I did look at it this weekend uh, Exeter play Bristol they and, do uh, they that is a that. guaranteed win these days the way Bristol have been playing and then um, meanwhile Gloucester travel away to Quinns and That's Northampton good. travel away to Saracens yeah. so if, if, if those games go as you might expect with Saracens and Quinns winning and uh, and Exeter winning all of a sudden you'd have three vying for one going into the last weekend which yeah. I think is an entirely possible scenario That's for the true. Premiership yeah. and there's also intrigue down in the European qualifiers top eight qualify for Europe um, one of Sale Exeter Northampton uh, no it's not Northampton uh, Exeter Sale London Irish and Wasps one of those four will miss, will miss out on Europe and Bristol will definitely miss out Bristol, Bristol, Bristol have, have sewn up that tennis spot for, 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 for forever they've been men. untouchable from below or, or above in 10th uh, all season yeah it's been an Anas or for sure and even at the top of the table Leicester were with a seemingly insurmountable lead that has slowly been chipped away at by Saris um, yeah they're not too far back from them now. What are it? It's only four points, so it's it's conceivable that the top seeding ends up being Saracens. Yeah. Not that it matters a whole hell of a lot. I mean, your top, your your winner, um, it, it, barring some ex, something extremely surprising, your winner is coming from that top three of yeah. uh, of, of Leicester, Saracens, and Quinns, who, who yeah. do seem a cut above the rest in this. Well, league. Well, there are two in terms of the form guides. The two teams that have won their last five is actually Northampton and Saracens as well. Yeah, so course. Northampton in decent form yeah, too, possible. No, I don't, um, I don't think Northampton are the same level as the top three maybe I'll be proven wrong but I, I, that's just my assessment for based on what I've been seeing from the sides yeah um, uh, anyway there's uh, also as well as as well as the goings on in Europe there's also been club footy going on around the world true and we're going to check in now with the American League Major League Rugby yeah. um, which is uh, just finished actually just wrapped up week 15 um, and I believe there are uh, just a couple of rounds to go, three rounds left in the regular season there as all of the European leagues or Northern Hemisphere leagues, I should say, are, are reaching their crescendo. Yeah. Um, we have uh, the New England side, the New England Free Jacks, uh, topping the Eastern Conference with a 12-1 and record. Very impressive. Um, while the more understated New York follows behind them, who just uh, handed Waisaki Naholo his debut. And uh, it was a little rusty on his first game in, in, in a while. But obviously, if they can get him anything close, close to top form yeah, that could be yeah. a game changer just in time for um, playoffs would be nice yeah ATL are the other side that are atop there and Toronto with work to do if they're going to yeah, get into that three, top three, three games they're, they're um, what are they set 10 points adrift or are they no sorry they're 7, seven points adrift, adrift. 7 but, points adrift yeah. which is, is surmountable but uh, yeah a lot needs to go right then the other conference, it's uh, the Austin Gilgronies uh, atop with 48. LA Giltini's last year's champions, just back on 44 with the Houston Sabercats on yeah. 41. They make up the top They've had an three. interesting model, the Houston Sabercats. They're, they're perusing through South African schools rugby, the varsity stuff, and they're, and they're, and they're picking up boys hosing, up, hosing up talent. 
That's not a, not a bad yeah, not a bad yeah, way yeah. to go. Uh, yeah. The other team that could yet feature are the San Diego Legion on thirty seven, and actually the Seattle uh, sea, sea Wolves as well. On yes, 36. San Diego just had a big win on the other day against uh, the Guiltinis, which was definitely That's big, big and, and, and puts yeah. them back in the mix. It, it, this conference has been volatile. There there are a few good sides. There are five good teams in it. So five is into three. There's a bit of jostling to be done. Houston holds the uh, the buffer at the minute, but mm. with three games to go, that could slip away from them if they they drop the ball. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah. been a fun league, decent crowds, decent atmosphere, always always a good watch, always for free on the rugbynetwork.com, so that ease of access definitely helps us. Although one thing I would say is that sometimes they're playing these games on these pitches that have like a gridiron and a basketball and a rugby and a soccer, yeah. all just all of those lines crammed into it's one true. of the pitch and yeah. you're looking at it going what is going on yeah. where is the rugby pitch and yeah, all of this a bit dizzy um, yeah, some of the try line isn't entirely yeah, obvious a, on the TV a, a dry track would be would be a better solution for some of those games it does just look ridiculous it's true and then the other caveat is um, the 0-14 o- Dallas Jackals the new franchise mm-hmm. it's unfortunate uh, whenever yes, there's the repeated look, deaths much, of Jackals yes much um, like when uh, when a new league comes up I, and I want to see it get a final done and want to see it sewn <laughs> up in the same way as when a new franchise pops up I do want to see them get a win yes. um, what I, what I'm delighted with, with they've that had super some close ones as well to. they've been very close on a few occasions it just Before hasn't happened losing I still points. as you pointed out I, I haven't forgiven the organisers for like they're a new franchise and yet it was like week three when they played at home first yeah, yeah. and they'd already shipped two pumpings yeah. and the, the gloss was the gone the mystique was gone yeah, yeah. so like I, yeah, they, they were done dirty by the tournament organisers but that's not the whole story 0-14 is, a, is an ugly tale so a lot of a lot of improvement to be made for there but uh, yeah the playoff picture is getting clearer but is not entirely set in stone just yet so it remains to be seen who will be playing in the postseason there um, in Japan however in uh, Japan Rugby League 1 uh, we do have the semi-final set we have we have done away with these blowouts that do ha- yes. feature throughout the regular <laughs> season some of the beach rugby that Damien McKenzie and the boys are, enjoy playing is now finished because we have four very competent teams f- lining up in the final four uh, that's coming up this weekend, I think. The um, the Suntory, yes, that's right. Suntory, Sun Goliath finished top seeds. They'll face the Tishima They're no longer Brave Suntory, Lucas. I believe. They're now the Tokyo Sun Goliath. Oh, the Tokyo yeah, Sun Goliath. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they are uh, going to face the Toshiba Brave Lupus, to have given their full name. They, they finished fourth. While the Wild Knights, last year's champions, uh, finished second, and they'll face the Kubota Spears. Mm. Um, those games both play, taking place yeah, this weekend, and then the final will be the weekend after that. So we will have a champion in Japan in a couple of weeks' time as well yeah and, and so, uh, the, the, the uh, so it's usually Suntory and um, and, and Wild Knights uh, and, and which Wild are the top Knights. two seeds but going the, in the, 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 um, the uh, 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 t- the team that the Suntory uh, side are playing the um Oh, what are they called? Brave Lupus. Brave Lupus uh, beat them the last time out, yeah. twenty-seven three. So, so uh, that, 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 that that'll definitely dynamic. be that was their last regular season game. So that's definitely a dynamic that they're going back into that off the back of a loss. True. And uh, the Kaboto Spears against the Wild Knights. I'm not sure if if I trust them to get that job done. Um, the they Wild do have, Knights have been very good. Yeah, but Ber- yeah. Bernard Foley's uh, charges are the Kubota Spears. Yeah. So fair play to them for making the knockouts, and uh, we shall see. We, we shall, shall see. Yeah, no, a couple, it up couple, to the main couple of good games though in Japan. Those those are four very good teams to be fair, and you've seen that through the regular season. The only issue is sometimes the mismatches through the regular yeah. season. But excited once we get into the postseason thing, and uh, yeah, it's wrapping up. In, in concert with a lot of these other leagues around the world, world as well um, and meanwhile in South America to move across the globe very quickly um, we, we are getting towards that finals footy stage as well we have our final four the semi-finals decided um, it did finish with Penarol I think on top so That's they right. will play the Cafeteras Pro um, while Selknam finished in second and will face the Jaguares uh, in the semi-finals Interesting, interesting season all around. The Jaguars shipping a couple of L's. They have not been the dominant side, and um, the Cobras got their got a win. Un- unlike what we were just highlighting with the Dallas Jackals, you know the Cobras have had yeah. a win. They are bo- dead oh, bottom. They are out of the, the d- reckoning. Draft but. system just a total success. Yeah. Although worth noting that Selknam is a or a Penarol rather are like majority Uruguayan, yeah. almost almost entirely Uruguayan. Yeah, I and believe it. Top I of that. Top yeah, of that, that league. Uruguay, those Uruguayans can yeah, play yeah. ball. We know so this. It's very exciting for. South American rugby and it has been televised and got a bit of traction over there it's tough to watch over here it's you very can what is it Star it. Plus I've but tried a million States I've tried a million yeah. times to, to get live footy and it, I just can't source it if anyone has a has a source for, for a game I'd definitely watch with curiosity especially with these semi-finals coming up this weekend yeah. I'd love to watch some of them but at the moment we're restricted to highlights but it's just been brilliant to see 
um, the, the sides all, all getting wins and uh, the draft system making it way more competitive yeah, than it was and, last and, year and now we're going to have some more competitive finals than we had last year and then another draft and yeah, then, and then maybe, potentially who more franchises is the next thing yeah, yeah, in know, contention and, next year then maybe the Cobras are top of the table or second yeah, next year well, you never know and exactly. that would vindicate the draft system entirely but also yeah great to see like if that if that league can grow legs and then marry with the MLR like with all this movement that's going on between a marriage with the MLR would be a great idea and yeah. then the Champions Cup it's all you'd have to do is yeah. start with one game yeah. win, winner v winner and then slowly so, you're building a legacy and then yeah. slowly and this surely this is what I'm thinking this yeah. is what I'm thinking there's potential I mean, this, the Heineken Cup didn't used to be a thing no it didn't, it didn't. To 20, well, neither did the MLR which is now going ago. very very well Slar is yeah. only one year, ne- nearly two years old yeah, um, building yeah. traditions slowly but surely and growing the game while doing so so that is all great to see um, but we should also touch on a long-established uh, traditional uh, battle, yes. the Super Rugby Not Pacifica. trying to build a brand particularly um, when you have Super Rugby. Um, yes, yeah, Super I mean, Rugby has been very exciting, to be honest. And we are getting now into the clearer playoff picture. Um, now that a few weeks ago the Highlanders managed to snake their way in, so they did to make the all the Kiwi teams are now currently in the playoff picture, which has been the status quo in this league, even through many changes in the last few years. But it's been tighter this year. It's been more competitive. Uh, teams like the Waratahs are resurgent. They look so much better. Um, what is it? Edmund? Are they the new 10 that they have as well? Very good looking uh, young young fella, young ginger lad who's running a lovely game. Uh, yeah, the, the Taz back in action is good for Aussie rugby. The Reds still very competent, although they've been plagued by COVID and injuries throughout this campaign, but they're still sitting in sixth. Uh, yeah. the, the Crusaders less imperious much like the Haguars we were citing before the Crusaders are sitting in third this year going into playoffs picture yeah, it's been the nine, Brumbies and the Blues who've been nine, lighting it up 9-3 and three for the Crusaders but they did have a good win against the Brumbies the other week they the did. Brumbies have been magnificent I mean mm. they for me they've been they've been an absolute joy to watch since, since the opening weekends even when they did have that loss against the Reds what I loved about them was their clinicality and it's still there yeah. Nicky Tao and the boys but they, they're they clinical from the mall like they always are but they have just another edge of being able to grab tries when they enter the red zone Nick White's been brilliant for them but then also Lonergan coming on yeah. they have a great tempo they have now a great back line so they run the ball really well but they also have the physicality yeah, that they still have had a to very organised offensive um, mall which is part of their they, DNA they, yeah. they were a little exposed by the ruthless and relentless pressure that the Crusaders brought out in their ground but to get a win away in the Chiefs and to win so convincingly in that yeah, game and to just very outscore impressive. that team yeah. was brilliant. I mean, they were 3-0 against the Kiwi sides going into that Crusaders game and they should be mostly very, very buoyed, by, buoyed and confident by where they are. I would um, think they are. So uh, the, the dark horses of obviously the Islanders and the Hurricanes snaking up the rear. I think the Hurricanes, uh, yeah, hurricanes they, they could, could be good. Could Jordy be good. Barrett's playing well at yeah, 12. They, they, they've, they've a lot of... Yeah, they've they've a niggly ability. Like they they went and came back from fifteen point deficit against the Waratahs, and those are just little performances like that where they just dug it out bit by bit, ground out the win. Like that's a good sign for a team heading into finals footy. So they're they're absolutely my dark horses. Yeah, and but Queens and Reds as well. I don't think they're dark horses to win necessarily, but I think they could improve. They need to get they, they have yeah, way more potential. They've been missing two yeah. by the last few weeks. They um, were missing JOC for a few weeks as well, and, and losing games there. So it, it hasn't really like from the opening bell with this season when they were the ones yeah. plagued by COVID. It's felt like yeah, they, you know they they were champions last year. It's felt like it's been you know one thing after the other and not quite right this it's year. Right, yeah, but no, they've never been in rhythm, and even yeah. when they got the team more or less back together for last week against the Blues they played us face to side that were just arriving at a rhythm that was so far above where the Reds were and they were blown away by it yeah, so and the Blues also like impressive as ever with Bodie at 10 you'd think is this their year to finally go and win Super Rugby maybe um, I maybe. think it could be having won the little Aotearoa competition yeah, no, Trans Tasman and this last is kind year. of a Trans Tasman they're going to try and defend this the Trans Tasman yeah, this yeah. is legit Super Rugby this time yeah, so it feels like it, they, they haven't won one this is actually well, there goes are, in there the are some crowds it's, we've had a bit of a picture um, also just down at the bottom out of the playoff picture but the Fiji and Drua and the Moana Pacifica in their debut seasons have not disappointed oh, they, both have, they both have wins they, they, they both played some brilliant brilliant stuff uh, or, sorry no sorry Moana Pacifica are, are, have not have they they, they have won yeah they, they have, have they yeah, said, yeah they did so um, yeah so I'm, I'm proud of both of them they've, been, they've contributed to some beautiful games the form guide down at the bottom is pretty poor the last five games of both Moana Pacifica and Fiji and Drua and the Western Force who I'm also a big fan of their hustle yeah. as well it's it's kind of come but, I mean, stuff they, towards they, Moana the end Pacifica but, I mean they've had uh, four point loss to the Rebels yeah. they had a six point defeat uh, to the Waratahs 
they've contributed like they've been yeah. they've been all of these games have been super competitive and even though as the intensity is rising and i think the pace of play has taken a, a noticeable jump up it in has. recent it weeks has. and months yeah. from where it was at the start of the season and i think the kiwi teams are starting to edge it except the brumbies are still competitive yeah. and even the rebels nearly I mean, nearly yeah, got I mean, a result right in mass fashion in terms of winning um, their first game anyway the, the taz v chiefs what, is where it is at the yeah. minute or chiefs v taz at what, the minute what, what, mm-hmm. the ta- what the taz have is, is angus bell is such yeah, a weapon like that guy is extremely extraordinary and like the thing that excites me most about it is while the kiwis are still ahead it feels much more like the natural new zealand australia rivalry in rugby than sort of some of the stuff we've been seeing over yeah, the last 10 the years last where there's, lows, there's no rivalry the, the bled us low blowouts um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like a tier one versus tier two kind of game kind of situation sometimes like I think heading into Bledisloe this year, if if Dave Rennie can put the pieces of these Aussie teams together in the right sequence, yeah. like he's going to have a very very competitive team. Some of the players that that have been stalwarts of the team are in fine fettle. Like obviously they want Tupo back, but Angus Bell has been magnificent. Falau Fianga has been min- uh, magnificent for the Rebels. Matt Phillip has been brilliant. A- Andrew Kellaway was bagging tries, getting balls bouncing for him the other week as well. Yeah. Icky Tao is in stunning form. That's true. And if they can it's put true. it all together, yeah, sure. Um, even have like they, yeah, they're, yeah. they're all believing leaving in Dave Ray sure it wasn't Nick, Val- Nick, Nick White was saying he was turn, they were turning down offers big money to play in Japan because yeah. he wants to stay in Australia oh, to play with the, with the Wallabies it's some their nice buying things are happening yeah, and yeah. as for the Kiwi teams they're getting there they're not mm. quite at the at the high fever pitch level that they were at the Blues at times look close yeah. uh, but it'll be interesting to see how much they improve heading into the business end of finals footy and whether they can really Cement their cement their place above the Aussies in advance yeah, of that Bledisloe series. The, 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 the Kiwi, the Aussie, the trans yeah. dynamic will be even clearer in knockout footy. How, how yeah. does it, how does it stack up when when all the chips are down? Uh, yeah, it remains to be seen. But we have a, a few more weeks weeks of action, I think. But uh, but also we're getting into that. You know, I think it's three. Is it yeah, three, that's right. Three yeah. more weeks. Juicy, um, juicy. Yeah, the, the playoff come. picture is is getting clearer. I mean, the Rebels are just outside it, and as are the Western Force. The Highlanders are only just clanging clinging on by two points to that final knockout spot but I'm kind of yeah, it's, it's kind just, of it's thinking just for, it's just two for on. most teams it's three for the uh, the, the force and the um, Moana Pacifica but it's just two for the for the rest I believe right yeah um, but yeah no it's, uh, it's basically basically we're at we're at business time and uh, yeah I'm really looking forward to watching the, the finale of it and we'll be definitely coming back to Super Rugby as it enters into its uh, into its finals footy and taking given that it's appropriate watch as well because there'll be eight teams in the playoffs and actually, as silly as it is to have an eighteen playoff competition in a league with twelve, the cutoff between Rebels and Highlanders feels just about right. And actually, the Highlanders have played with some decent tempo themselves in recent weeks with Aaron Smith, so uh, and Fa- and Fakatava as well. Um, so they'll be good value in the playoffs as well. So actually, there'll be eight class teams, which just means four great quarterfinals two great semi-finals and a great final all to come in yeah. Super Rugby what, what more could you want you know Super yeah. Rugby getting into the business end too you love to see it it's such a stalwart part of any any rugby fans calendar as well And but likewise we are going to touch on the 7 series which is also a great watch for any rugby fan as well just, sure. just whenever whenever it's on on the weekend it's always readily available unlike the South American stuff it's normally up on YouTube to be watched live if you want to be doing that but uh, yeah we have a, a tournament coming up in Toulouse actually um, and it's going to gonna be great we have both the women and the men involved in this one so a full tournament for the full series back in, in full swing as well um, in the women's game uh, Australia have already been crowned champions they're yes. clear head and shoulders above France in second by 20 points I think they're clear at top so they've already been awarded that uh, that tournament but uh, it's been two other medal spots to be competing indeed in France and USA currently but uh, Russia and Ireland and Fiji still Although in the mix R- Russia of course they're, they're so kicked they're, out they're but uh, Ireland, Ireland Fiji and Canada maybe uh, Ireland are clean. right in the mix for, for, for a, a medal spot and that'll be huge from, from their point of view to try and make a charge at that um, the, two, the pools this week Ireland, France, Brazil and England in one pill in one pool um, Brazil being the wild card in there but that's a, that's a great uh, European ding dong between Ireland, England and France no doubt yeah. uh, New Zealand, Canada and Spain and Scotland in pool B and also Australia, the champions USA, Fiji, and South Africa in the other pool as well. And um, so that those those games will all be taking place in Toulouse this week. 
in yeah, the women's that's right and in the men's it's a bit more tight you know South Africa were running away with it when it was only South Africa and, and us and, and a few and other Argentina. and Argentina and a few mm-hmm. other teams being invited from all over the world who didn't who were breaking COVID uh, restrictions at the, at the beginning of it yeah South Africa romped away to a nearly insurmountable lead they're on 111 now but the steady Pumas who've been awesome have narrowed that gap they're on 105 now and could pip them with a good result in, in, in this weekend you know Australia also on 100 they They've been brilliant as well they had since coming back in. USA then on 70. Then ourselves, Ireland on 69. Fiji only just into the competition and nearly catching us with, uh, what is it, 65. Yeah, they will catch they, us. They will catch us. Yeah. They're, they're playing some brilliant stuff at the minute. France also playing good stuff on 64. England always competitive. And even Spain, Kenya, New Zealand, uh, they're, they're, they're a little late to the game. Off, bit of a drop-off. Yeah. A lot of these teams are late to the game. Um, it's, so kind of, it's getting back into its... its yeah. Full full swing, full flight, because it is it's yeah. it's a jet setting tournament where they just bunny hop around the world. So you know, New Zealand and Samoa drop back in, and already they've made quite the impression. Samoa yeah. in particular, great to see them back. Yeah, they, they have a really great uh, sevens tradition, and we're actually the best side in sevens a good few years back. Yeah, so great to see them nearly back, and actually between Wales, Japan, Scotland, and Canada. Uh, one, two of those teams will go into relegation, um, which is uh, definitely high stakes for them. Samoa yeah. being exempt because of how late they arrived at the party. Right. Um, and uh, just as far as the pools that are going ahead this week in the men's competition, um, Samoa, South Africa, Ireland, and Spain in one group is really tough for our, our charges. Um, we hope we hope to see us conquer Samoa, but that Samoan team is really good, and obviously South Africa exceptional as well, and really holding the Indian sign over the Irish team. Um, yes. Then Australia, New Zealand, Scotland, and USA in another great pool. Fiji, France, Wales, and Kenya, and then finally in in the fourth pool, Argentina, England, Canada, and Japan. Um, and all obviously. good action, yeah, yeah, all all great action. Two two from each team to go into the cup quarterfinals. Um, heading into that. Uh, second day of the Toulouse Sevens which take place this weekend so yes that definitely makes for good viewing does, on yeah. any weekend it does well, whenever um, it's on it's worth sticking on because you'll normally see some box office stuff and some super athletes playing uh, a great version of, of the game of rugby that we that we do love and also it's a World Cup year as well so all of those sides are going to be kind of you know sharpening themselves up for that later in the year as well that World Cup so yeah there's a lot of lot of intrigue going on I know in the women's game the, uh, the actually from an Irish point of view they already took the Six Nations players the 15s players off into camp for the previous tournament which was in Langley a few weeks ago I think or not Langley it was in what was it Langford in uh, Canada a few weeks ago and yeah just they, they ended up performing really well all of these teams are kind of eyeballing that World Cup preparation from now on and looking to kind of target that tournament and um, which is probably not music to the South Africa the Blitzbox ears who felt like they'd had this all sewn up for I'm a not year sure out, how well they uh, timed their, their, their form but they'll have time to rally now as well they're, and they're, they're, still, they're still in the driver's seat to win the competition but man oh man that Argentinian team is really really exciting um, yeah. Marcus Manetta super player but just the way that they're playing they they just kick more freely than any seven side you'd see they just back their pace as well yeah. so they'll just kick, they'll kick it right from, yeah no yeah. indeed they'll just see a little bit of space over the top they just kick it into it and charge after it and have the footballing skills along with to the speed dribble it if need be <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. 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 savage team to watch. I remember seeing I think it was a lower level game while Ireland were still qualifying it was Chile they were playing and Chile were at that as well they were kicking Kicking, kicking everything they yeah. weren't really passing the ball they were just kind of playing football it was great fun on the sevens <laughs> pitch but uh, yeah you know, a, bit, a bit of those South American techers you gotta you know football's a religion down it. there there's definitely room for it in uh, in the sevens game so yeah that is the sevens series great to see it back in the mix and it is on this weekend so definitely check that out as I said it's readily available they, World Nor- Rugby normally stream it on YouTube so you know Always if you watch, find yeah. yourself bored just stick that on but with that we are going to move on to our final segment of the show the Rugby news of the week and uh, it is quite a big segment this week for we haven't been with you for a few weeks so we've missed out on quite a few little uh, little bits that have happened in uh, the interim we're going to start with the you know head sp- head palm face palming uh, kind of news as we were saying we were covering the rugby europe championship spain did finish in the world cup qualification spot but uh, there was that little caveat of the ineligible player or the ceiling, well, the South African prop that they had fielded in the two games they played against the Netherlands. And World Rugby has taken the decision to, uh, well, they issued a full statement on it, but effectively they're going to issue a points reduction, which is going to take them out of the World Cup. That's right. Um, um, yeah, five points for each of the two games in yeah. which Vandenberg appeared. Mm-hmm. Um 
Yeah, I mean, it's their bit. It's they, they had a, they, crazy that this has happened again, considering the fact that they missed out the last time because of something very, very similar. Yeah. It's wild how mm. this has come about. And it's even wilder that it's the two games against the Netherlands where it couldn't matter a toss. You could have yeah, picked me came, a tight head and you probably came still would have won. He um, didn't start. Yeah, he like, came on as a sub. He played a cumulative of about 50 minutes um, for them in the whole of qualifying. Gavin Vandenberg is his name. He had not been a resident of Spain for the 36-month period. And then um, someone actually he, falsified his... Well, yeah, really indeed. Like there's the, the, all the, kinds the, of fidgy the, going well, on behind the, the scenes the, when they should have just picked a Spanish pro. No, I don't, well, yeah. indeed, yeah. Well, they, basically, um, they, uh, they uh, uh, World Rugby released a full report on it and they found that representative from his club had apparently, without either the knowledge of the Spanish Rugby uh, Union or the knowledge of the player, tampered with his travel stamps in, in his passport to make it seem like he had been ba- basically not out of the country for more than two months during uh, 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 2020 which was obviously the year COVID happened where he was out of the country for quite a bit more than that and um, as basically they were doing that to facilitate his classification as a domestic player which would be of benefit to the club in, and uh, the club in question was, was um, sanctioned by uh, Spain heavily they were due to play in the Spanish Cup final and, and were kicked out of that um, they were also meant to play a game against Italy this summer. That's now. Yeah. That's now annexed or is it kind of just nixed uh, instead because yeah, that's well, yeah, it's crazy. Like I, I just I feel bad for players like Rue for the coaches for <laughs> I just it's it's crazy. They 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 were in on merit. It seemed they they'd won it. It was a very competitive one. We were having great fun covering mm-hmm. it, but they they did pit Portugal. They they got the important points. And it's just to, to have it come down to stuff like this is is a bit tragic um, yeah, for the players I mean, involved who've been very committed and playing a beautiful brand. Yeah, um, abs- I don't know, absolutely here here on that. I mean, it's yeah, it's a curious one in the sense like it, it, they, they, they're saying basically the, pans- the passport tampering is irrelevant because there wasn't any uh, FE or the, the Rugby Federation didn't inquire into the player. And I think that's where the dust is settling on this is just that the FA, FE or didn't do their due, do, their due diligence on the player assumed that the club's records that they were presented with were correct mm-hmm. fielded him uh, fielded him then for Spain on the assumption based on everything that they've been told by the club and um, that he was a qualified player and then obviously it's emerged now that he was not legitimately qualified uh, to play for them so they've docked them five points for the two games in question which is consistent with what they did four years ago where they docked every team uh, five points per match per player that was ineligible yeah. Um now, now and that that resulted in Russia bunny hopping correct. above several um, teams to get in. Um, yeah, and and in the in the time since then, obviously, like, like you were talking about the, the issues with Rue. I mean, it was just the last time we spoke about Spain. It was this amazing, it was great performance. Yeah, you can and check the podcast. The we we did. Um, I can't remember which one it was on. It was a few ones back, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it was it was a great moment. They they earned it. They they were great scenes at full time. They were delighted. Yeah, um, and, and yeah. yeah, and as you say, from the fallback of all of this, there's been players have been sort of revolting. There's been loads of interviews given about her sort of how let down they feel and it is a mistake a really bad um, mistake um, from the Spanish Rugby Union um, but Alcobendas is the name of the club and they're obviously um, just a public enemy number one and as far as Spain are concerned um, Spain's test player is apparently pre- uh, preparing a formal letter requesting the, the union itself be completely overhauled they don't accept their reasoning uh, they feel completely cheated and um, and uh, yeah, a number of players, Fred Corsi, um, has just been sort of um, uh, 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 rat- ranting against them. Rue saying that he doesn't uh, fancy playing for Spain again okay. after it, yeah. feeling really hurt by it. These class players who were at the centre of such a wonderful moment for Spanish rugby now basically turning on the union. Yeah, well, um, I must now say, what might only be a moment if it's a completely rebuilt team now. If they, those guys are out, then it's like... Yeah, well, well indeed, yeah. It, it set them back. It set them yeah. back about five years. Mm-hmm. What I will say is that there is an appeal going ahead at the moment. And listen, the, the ruling that World Rugby has made that the FEOR was negligent and consistent with their earlier... Um, Sanctions. It doesn't make sense that it would be overturned. I think what you have to argue from a Spanish point of view is, does the punishment here fit the crime? Yeah. And I'm not sure that it does personally. I like. I think it was obviously stupid, but just factoring in the fact that the player had zero influence on their qualifying, factoring in the fact that the uh, player and the union were both lied to by a malicious club. Mm-hmm. I think that you, 
I think that you can, if if operating under the sort of auspices of common sense, work it down to some kind of financial penalty and not kick them out, not have it be a points deduction for those games and not kick them out of the World Cup. And I think if there is a way to get to that conclusion, World Rugby should go back and get to that conclusion because over the two years, they were the best side in Europe. Yeah. They, like this, they, this is a this is a crazy punishment to dole out to an emerging rugby nation that has shown such overwhelming positivity because their union, you know, over so oh, like made a mistake and and completely didn't do their due diligence. All of that's fair enough, but I don't think it's right. But just given the context of the situation and just how little it mattered um, from from Vandenberg's presence in the team, what just how man. little an impact it made. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense to me to kick them out of the World Cup, and I hope that they reverse the decision. I don't think that's going to happen, but yeah, I, I, I really hope they, they reverse I mean, the decision. The, the I don't think it's right. As you said, yeah. the precedent is there, and, you know, and the Romania other, the, would kick up a storm if it, as, yeah. as would maybe Portugal yeah, 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 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And the other precedent that is there is that like Spain were involved in that precedent four years ago, mm. so there's no good behavior argument here. No, there's, there, it's no there like isn't. It's the no, same no. thing, and, and um, the same problem. Like Portugal were involved in that Romania last time too. They haven't been involved this time. They have done their due diligence and fielded the players properly and they've learned their lesson because of the severity I know, of the punishment. But they, they could, but and they, Russia did deliver when they got to the World Cup, albeit oh, like oh, through the, that avenue as well. So. They didn't deliver as good as an actually good team. No, but, no, 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 um, they didn't. But, they, they didn't but, at all. But it's, yeah, they, I think the precedent's already there. I think it's going yeah, to be... But I, I don't agree. I, I must say I don't agree with it. That's fair I don't, enough. I don't agree. Like, maybe, the, maybe it's my pet love of Portugal that's making no, me, but, making but me it's, like... But it's, but it's not It's not right. Like, it isn't. It's This isn't something that materially affected anything that went no, on it's not true. the case that like if it was Ordas yeah, then sure, well, then sure yeah. but no this was not a guy who featured in the team at all so for me it's not right I think that Royal Rugby should, should wind the neck in because it just, it's just taken the hammer to mm. Spanish rugby over these FEOR issues like what you could do is sort of demand from a governing point of view structural changes within the FEOR and take on a kind of a hands on role and saying hang, hang on like you're not getting anything from us unless X Y Z changes. Yeah. And plus, here's some financial penalties. X Y Z. Like that's all fine. Like this cannot stand, etc. You must feel, you must do your due diligence about who has played for your country, etc. But just like I, I just think a bit of common sense. They there was no mal, there was no malicious intent. True. This was an oversight. This was not like I think. Let them let them pass. Let, let them play them in the play. World Cup. That's what they earned saying. the right. They earned the they right. Did. They, they did. earned the right on the field to play in the World Cup. I don't think it's fair to take the hammer to Spanish rugby because of uh, Vandenberg's appearance against the Netherlands. I just yes. don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're um, probably right. Fair in terms of that. Yeah. In, in terms of that macro, you're probably right. What it mean, what it does mean at the moment is that Portugal are back in the mix, which is great for them. It is, um, and they, they will be great yeah. value as well. Because such was the quality of the tournament that I wouldn't worry about about either of them going going to the World Cup in terms yeah. of creating creating spectacle. But uh, yeah, no, they, they, it, Romania it is a sour note. Straight in, yes, straight in Roma- as as it stands, Romania get the get the automatic get the Europe. Two spot and uh, and Portugal would then be in the repechage, which is uh, to come later in the year as well. Um, yeah, so that a bit bit of a, an, an annoying little nugget to attach to what was otherwise a great Rugby Europe Championship. It has to be restated: a fantastic Rugby Europe Championship and World Cup qualifier over two years, marred now by this uh, this issue with Spain. Um, but yes, we will move on because there is other news. Um, former England and Wasps winger Christian Wade and former Buffalo Bills. Uh, you know, well, still current, I think, Buffalo but no, Bills no training longer, squad, I don't no believe. longer. Yeah. He's cut from that, uh, but he was released from the Buffalo Bills and he's been linked with a move to Leicester in England, which would be, you know, he's 30, 30 years old now, Leicester are doing some good things, the man can score tries. Um, yeah. He scored several against Leinster, which is, I've seen them live, the man is, I think has the, wheels for days. The MLR even would be an interesting spot for him. Um, yeah. I'm surprised, actually, he didn't do something like sign a temporary contract with the MLR just to, just to maybe, just like, to get on the sh- field. Just to show off maybe what he could do a little bit 10 NFL coaches uh, who might be interested in him it was a shame the, the Buffalo Bills thing didn't work out he had a couple of bad injuries and just never was able to get any momentum it's true but uh, they also never gave him a chance they never really I mean, they, gave, they, him they gave him they gave him one, good, one good snap game. in a practice game and he scored a 40 yard touchdown and then they just never played him in the regular season so that's on them yeah. but anyway he's 30 now and uh, he might he might be coming back to rugby and you know, I'd be happy to see him I'm wishing him well fair play to him for taking on the challenge and, yeah uh, yeah. No, just, he's, he's an impressive athlete at the, the best of times and yeah. he's a very impressive winger when he gets back to um, it as well so yeah rooting for rooting for Christian Wade absolutely um, just a bit of other uh, signing news uh, 
Carl Tuinukuafe of uh, All Black fame and, musta- and mustache fame, of course, as well. One of the best mustaches in the game these days. I would, yeah. I would say probably the, the, the best. Well, maybe um, Dupria from Sale. That's a very <laughs> curly mustache. Yeah, <laughs> he's apparently um, signed for Montpellier. Yeah, um, who That's were right. basically they were tipped out of the European Cup the other week, but uh, he's he's basically going there and he's going to replace um, Nariashvili, who has been in Montpellier for years and years and yeah. years. Um, he was he's been twelve years and two hundred games at Montpellier, and apparently only joined after Gorgonza. Uh, this is a nugget from Tier Two Rugby on Twitter. Uh, he only joined them after Gorgonza got him a tryout. And then he apparently bl- broke the club strength uh, te- uh, record uh, <laughs> instantly. I love and, it. Uh, and was then he's signed. So, he's such a great Absolute player. Absolute horse now, really. But is. Tui Nuku Afe is, is coming in to replace him. And yeah. dare I say they're trading down? Um, well, I certainly think Tui Nuku Afe, like, um, he might be shocked by the amount of the, the scrummaging that goes on in that top tours is, is different gravy yeah. to what he, happens. He, he did have rugby. a stint um, before Tui Nuku Afe in the Pro Deux. Yeah. Um, before so he, he, so he, he won't be up, totally yeah. alien to him. Yeah. But, uh, but the demands on, on a front row player in that league yeah. are, are at pretty much as high as they get mm. in world rugby so and yeah big, big the, signing the, for him up yeah. the All Blacks are moving past the Tuna Kuafe dream story unfortunately are, unfortunately um, but I said like his dream rolls on Montpellier is a lovely place good luck to him I hope it goes really really well um, and any other signing news well other than I mentioned that uh, no, they turned down, Nick White turned down a big offer to join yeah, ja- yeah. join the Jap- Japanese league oh yeah other vague news was that uh, the uh, Warren Gatlin was kind of linked with uh, the USA Eagles. That's yet to be confirmed, but uh, as a you know, that would be a good signing for both both parties. I think I would like to see Warren Gatlin try a project like that, and yeah. I think the Eagles need some new th- new think very quickly. Yeah, um, Gatlin's the kind of guy who could put together a good coaching team and make some things happen, just in terms of talent, uh, professionalism, and talent yeah. uh, acquisition. organization, yeah. work ethic. Oh, yeah. that stuff. I don't, the only, the only thing is, it's a link that's post World Cup, and the the Eagles have been just very slow to move on anything, and they've had Gary Gold sitting there out of his depth for way too many years they unfortunately still haven't made the World Cup um, just yet have they they're in no they, they're have, they in, have they have they have a, a nightmare not, not too small task of no. Uruguay to deal with and I don't make them yeah. favourites as no, it stands no it's Chile oh it's Chile Uruguay, sorry yeah, no, and I still um, don't make they, them favourites as they, I stand they uh, dealt with uh, Uruguay by losing heavily to them that's right um that's then right. also just uh, in other news as well the Welsh uh, Rugby Union the WRU this was making all kinds of headlines a few weeks back but uh, they are proposing to cut the number of regional teams from four to three at this was a leaked uh, proposal well at the expense of potentially lots I mean they, 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 the Scarlet Ospreys merger from last year you'll recall and one of one of Wales Rugby's greatest hits um, yeah. was that whole talking point then the other option apparently was to sack the ax the Ospreys or the Dragons Dragons, uh, who have been dread dreadful for many years, but also have been sort of the WRU have been desperately trying to get them to be good by giving them all kinds of signings of Welsh players that have flopped there yes. for whatever reason. Um, but these are changes that would be planned from the beginning of the twenty three four season, so not next season, but the season after. Yeah, um, yeah, it's 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 been the cause of much uh, consternation and chat over the last few weeks. What should Wales rugby do? Should they just abandon the URC entirely and go off to the Premiership and abandon European rugby and just play at a lower level? Or should they get their houses in order and, and sort of put together stronger squads? Uh, I don't know. Well, it's, 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 it's like tough to say. These, these, these chats get dialed up when in years that well that the Wales national team are unsuccessful like this year yeah and they do end up getting heightened and these kinds of alarmist reactionary kind of chats do end up surfacing in it uh, yeah it's no it's no lie that the Wales were very disappointing this year and that the Welsh regions are way out of contention like the, the Welsh shield is being contested and the only prize at stake is is one seat at the European table and um, such is the level below that they're operating at they've been shipping a lot of hammer to a lot of URC teams so yep yeah, improvement needs need, need, needs improvement across the board and um, they need a better probably just a better pathway for, for young players which has always been the case they do produce a lot of talent keeping it is always tough the centralised contracts have helped with some of the stars but not all but yeah. a, lot, a lot of their well, best I just don't think they them. have like fundamentally they, they like obviously there's a, there's a financial issue here but there is what they really need in terms of building things like there's like every time I, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells whenever you talk about it especially coming from Leinster because they, they, they'll just throw yeah you, you you have a bigger budget they'll just throw that in your face I have a bigger budget you can do things we can't we have small budgets and that's the reason why 
you're more successful. Yeah, but to be budget, fair, to, be fair to Leinster, so much of it on like, Sam Lousy, like, well, you know, yeah, well, like, indeed. But uh, more, more is the point is like Leinster is a club that was built from like it, it's it's a it's a profitable organization now that was built from investment. Like there was heavy investment done in an academy structure and a school structure, which yes lended itself more naturally to the sort of regional format of the four provinces in Ireland and the Leinster School Seniors yes, Cup there's existing no, there's anyway. none of this anti-Ospreys um, sentiment that comes in because the, no, no that's yeah, just, yeah. and also just there's, there's the, nat, the, nat, the provinces are very natural easy thing there was the Schools Cups already existed the Provincial Championships in the GA and all that existed in Wales so it was easier to build but you need top class academies to find top class young talent to hone that talent to get them ready for prime time and, and pro rugby be yeah. like that that for me is the is the missing piece of the puzzle from it Wales is. and it takes investment to, to, to build that from the ground and then ultimately see returns yeah. on it it's, um, it's it's very rare that you see like a 19 or 20 year old play a URC game for Leinster it's actually it's only like yeah. it's, it's more often they're 21 22 year old because right. they've been in the academy for a few years uh, whereas right. with Welsh there's a sometimes there's a young kid who's like you just know, in ch- there chuck him in there in the URC him play, so play good, looks yeah, very good exactly. so there needs to be that kind of fostering of the talent and, yeah. and kind of yeah getting getting them sharper um, before you in, in, introduce them to that level but there's also getting the top side up to that level as well so I understand that the, the hurried nature to get some of these guys in sometimes but uh, yeah there's just a lot of improvement needs it's to be a, it's a slow build but I think, I think a, 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 a better academy structure would be just integral in terms because there's so much young talent coming out of Wales but I'm not sure that it's harnessed in quite the right way and a lot of them end up playing in the premiership and, yeah. and even being poached by England or, or those kind of you know obviously because the UK is one country and, and sort of mm. Gloucester and, uh, and and Bath very nearby really yeah um, but um, uh, it, 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 never, nevertheless I think identifying young talent and getting them into an academy structure from an early age is something that Welsh rugby could focus on but obviously the ins, a lot of people involved in Welsh rugby know the ins and outs of the financial situation but it takes investment to make to make good things happen for Welsh rugby. It takes investment. If you are of the opinion that there is a magical solution that doesn't involve investment and a lot of work from the ground up, like you know dumping off the URC and heading off to the Premiership or the champ and or the Championship, or just disbanding the regional system entirely and playing like the Welsh Premiership and merging that with the Championship, which I've also heard floated as an idea. I mean, I don't think that that's any any better a solution as far as the national team is concerned or engagement where rugby is concerned. I just, I just don't. I think you're you're just dooming yourselves to playing at a lower level domestically, which will inevitably hurt your test team because yeah. you won't be in Europe. You won't have those big time experiences. It's and true. I think that those are so necessary from 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 a large point of view. I also think the URC is coming on leaps and bounds, and the standard is great, and that that is a good playing at a high standard is a is a good and necessary thing. It is. It um, did the ri- the rising tide, you know raises all ships yes. ideally so you yeah, know it's it's like it, it's never doom and gloom. like there's a lot of doom and gloom in those bad years but Wales rugby has such a tradition and there's so many people playing it it's a small country but the the playing population of it is relatively big so it's like rugby's never disappearing there but yeah getting getting your house in order is probably the the macro point on it and you, as you say it takes investment it takes a slow build um, yeah, they they got to admit that they've done a lot of things wrong and, mm. and try and set about remedying them rather than just calling foul or calling referee not fair or calling you know money money more money in the Irish teams. It's, it's just impossible. Yeah, to there's compete. a lot. Like there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, and there's a lot. There's a lot of ill will towards the league, which I just think is misplaced. I think that is misplaced, um, especially now after this year. Like yeah. we were very openly critical of it, as you were saying for the last few years. But this year, I think it's been yeah. a better tournament than the Premiership. Honestly. I agree oh, for um, sure. So I think you it know, has been like, way more interesting week yeah. um, but that is always up for open to debate and I'm sure if there's any Welsh watching um, you, yeah, you let might, us know, you might let leave us, us know your, your views down let below let us know your take on that because like yeah I just, I just yeah I, I do have sympathy with it from a from just a functional point of view like when people are Pontypreed fans who quite can't stand the Ospreys or whatever like I understand that uh, that a little bit yeah, just your loyalty your club loyalty and you're divided in that sense but there's part of me that's like you've got to get over it and get in, in the same team and try and you know 
make these regions a success, honestly, which they've nearly been before. Yeah, like I honestly think the support would be there if the regions if were the regions were playing I think well, the bigger yeah. issue is just getting the regions to perform. Well, sure, that, that quarterfinal um, all those years back with Scarlet's, uh, when the party yeah, Scarlet's was actually full and they were getting the songs going Rochelle, against yeah. La Rochelle, and it was a fantastic occasion, right. and you want to see more of them in Wales, or in Welsh rugby, and it'll take the teams improving. That Scarlet's yeah. team were the last ones to get close to that level, yeah. um, but that was a few and years they, ago. They, they, they might not even be as far away as they look. You never know. Uh, as far as the talent coming through um, just another bit of news coming out of Argentina Michael Checa has been adding to his, uh, to his coaching staff he's added poached one particular person whose stock is pretty high given the European form of Leinster that is Felipe Contepomi Contopomi, who of course worked under Checo while he was at uh, Leinster, the uh, aforementioned. Uh, yes, they're, get, they're getting the Leinster uh, band back together. And yeah. it's in Argentina in time for a World Cup, you know. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's nervy signs from an Irish fan point of view, although they're on the other side of the draw from us. Yeah, and but he, he, also he, good luck to Felipe. Absolutely. And yeah, it's very, very exciting time for Pumas rugby, real fresh start. Um, he's also signed a, an NRL coach, um, Interesting. interestingly, from, from League, uh, David Kidwell, who's also former, he's currently coaching an NRL team but was also coaching the Kiwis the All Black or the New Zealand um, uh, Rugby League team interesting um, which is definitely an interesting one um, Felipe obviously taking the offence um, checks overseeing things um, it's 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 got it's got a potentially very new flavour to it a bit of razzmatazz bit of excitement and I think with the combination of these this new blood this new mindset, um, what we're seeing in, in Slar, yeah. and what we're seeing by the Sevens team, like Marcus yeah. Mineta is apparently going to be seeing, straight in. What we've been seeing um, for years is unlike what Welsh rugby, what we were just critical of, like the Argentinian school system is churning out talent. It's yeah. churning out talent, and just unlike what Leinster do and fostering them within the academy, they do some of that, but they also just send them around. They have the Slar draft, you have kids popping up in France who are Argentinian who are great Italy another place where there are a lot of Argentinians playing their trade playing rugby yeah they're producing talent so it, it makes no sense that their their national side was underperforming to the extent they were oh, no, I think, um, I think particularly on offense yeah. and I think the addition of Felipe Contepomi plus you know Michael Cech's pedigree and it's going to be a, a sea change for Argentinian rugby and probably yeah. a, new, a new philosophy to come from the Com- Pumas complete change of focus right at the same time in the cycle that the Springboks did it last time yeah. and so they'll know that they have plenty of time to work with the only thing is they get graded on a very steep curve going into the rugby championship against like three teams that have been Top building so teams. nicely yeah. Um, yeah, yeah but nevertheless i think i think they're well the value to be the a much better the team bar is also low considering they're showing last year it, it, yes, it couldn't indeed. be worse it, to be honest it really it couldn't, couldn't. cuz um, they, they not only did they lose they looked ugly while doing they it, lost which is not ugly, like them and they started by limping over the line against romania and it got, you yes. know like yeah, yeah. Know, last year was 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 anus horribleus and uh, hopefully Pumas. hopefully yeah, yeah. we're turning a corner here with the signings of Felipe Contepomi and others and in other signing news actually ex monster scrum half Mike Prendergast, he's set to rejoin the Irish province as the new attack coach. Yes. Um, he has been applying his trade with Racing 92, who uh, you may recognise from putting together very silky backline moves. Yes. Um, he's also, he's been in France for a fair few years. He's, he's coached with uh, with Bernard Jackman at Grenoble. He was also at Oyana and Stade Francais. Um, he's obviously now, he's found a home at, at Racing for the last few years, but we're going to repatriate him, which is part of the, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the rugby brain drain. We're, we're starting to produce some coaches overseas, some Irish coaches which is doing very well. You think Ron Nogari, obviously La Rochelle, Mark McCall over in Saris. But yeah, Mike Prendergast kind of flies under the radar sometimes, but he's been doing stellar work in France yeah. for nigh oh, on a decade. It's amusing um, that the amount of credit that Bernard Jackman got with that Grenoble team, and yeah. they, like they fell off a cliff the second uh, Prendergast left them. They did. And what was always great about them was their offense. It's and true. The, the way they moved the ball. Which bodes well he's for Munster, a, who definitely need a bit of this sprinkler. And yeah. he's a Munster man, so they'll, they'll, they'll listen. Yes, exactly. Um, a Munster man telling them the way. Not like when Rob Penny comes in and says no no the forwards should be over here and the forwards look at him like what are you talking about and to be <laughs> fair they've been more ready to embrace they it have. than all that they I have. think I think Munster will be in a healthy place I think, I think he's, so. he's a great addition to the to the Brains Trust under Roundtree and I think yeah there's promising things to come from Munster and potentially a real challenge to Leinster's crown at the top of Irish rugby yeah. uh, coming in the years in the years to come um, 
just another tidbit as well. Um, actually, we had the European Player of the Year nominees uh, yes. announced ahead of the final. And curiously, they would announce a winner before the final just so they, they can present him the award uh, at, on the day of the final, which is always dubious because I feel like the winner of this award is, is made or break, made, 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 make or break on the final yeah. one, I think. And I'm much like the short list being named at, in the pool stage when no games oh, are the, played. Yeah, the, the, the long list that was named during the Six Nations. Well, funnily enough, James Lowe, who wasn't named on, on that long list, is named on this short list, just, making that just, long list it's completely just, just, just the 10 tries on top tries. Score and yeah. just, you know, I mean, good on them for not sticking to their silly list from yes, January and, and just picking James Lowe because he'd earned it. The nominees are Josh van der Fleer, James Lowe, Caelan Doris, Greg Aldrich, and Antoine Dupont. Um, Dupont might be in there a little on reputation. Mm, I mean, I didn't think he had a great game against Ulster or against Munster, so I think not that particularly be. against Leinster either. No, he did yeah. grab that try. Yeah, but, yeah he was good. Yeah. Like he's he's Antoine Dupont. Like he's he's a phenomenal, phenomenal player. But I don't think he was necessary in the. To be honest, the I think between anything. whiskey for Leinster and even a little Lagaric for uh, Rassing, I think there have been better scrummies in the Champions Cup this year. Are they really on form? Um, so- on form. Um, um, but yeah, you know, like, I don't. I don't think he's Jonathan Dante a little unlucky I John, feel Dante like um, Aldred obviously does deserve to be there Vito um, has been good as well Victor Vito yeah, yeah absolutely very, very good um, um, yeah. even Peter O'Mahony jeez Herculean against Ex- between Exeter and that performance against Toulouse I'd be very tempted to pick Peter yeah, O'Mahony yeah no, it's insane true. although granted you kind of have to be at the at the business end to get John- in there Jonathan Sexton overlooked once again despite ah, the yes. form despite the just go- <laughs> goatiness of everything he's doing at the moment <laughs> Um, um, yes, but listen, we'll move on from that. Um, there was an, another tidbit that's uh, just worth mentioning was um, uh, Eben Etzebeth was was touting a potential sea change as well, saying that uh, South Africa joining the Six Nations makes perfect sense and is something he would be fully in support of. Um, he, say, he says, quote, uh, I think the Six Nations would be good for us. Obvi- quote, obviously it just makes sense with us playing in the URC at the moment against the same competition. Um, very interesting um, and then he was saying maybe we could have a full June series against New Zealand play in the Six Nations and then have an end of year tour in Australia or Argentina asking for the whole world <laughs> they calendar just to be take, just they played just around South take, Africa take the world um, on yeah well yeah. I'm not sure that he quite gets to write the dream calendar and then, and then he can just you know like, that, like but, uh, in between games for South Africa against the rest of the world he can just chill it in Toulon's gym and you know <laughs> pump iron and, and chill. I mean, yeah, they're um, they're uh, they're working they're working their way back towards uh d- towards this uh, t- uh conclusion. I think of in the long run, I'm I'm definitely yeah. I think it I think it is in our future. So oh, I, I would, yes, I won't be surprised yeah. to see it announced. Um, yeah, another world rugby, other machinations world rugby have as well. They've announced their uh, locations or confirmed the locations for the next three women's and uh, two men's rugby world cups it's accelerating it's global development and growth so england are going to host the 2025 women's world cup as we mentioned earlier it's on in the year like they are getting the best crowds and they're playing the best footy that's that's yeah, an easy they, call they're getting um, great crowds for some of the women's games so that'll be really well loads supported. of great stadium yeah. like yeah that'll, that'll be that'll be, be a huge that. moment for women's rugby i mean this world this year's world cup would be great england's in four years time will take it to a whole other level yeah yeah 100 percent. and then australia are going to host the Rugby World Cup 2027 and the 2029 Women's World Cup. They they have been bit bitten the bug through this COVID thing of just hosting all the rugby. They hey, love it. Listen, they, they, love be, it. they better get out and go to the games. That's all I'll say. Yeah, but at the same true. time, this would be a huge economic windfall for for Rugby Australia, and true. hopefully they can make hay. Yeah. And it looks like they're building a team. Uh, they're back to building a team that's on its way to being very competitive in the men's game. And we know that their women's team yeah. will be competitive come come uh, 2029 true. as but, well. I but, don't doubt. But perhaps the most interesting announcement of all was the USA set to host the 2031 Men's World Cup and the 2033 Women's World Cup so that's giving them giving them plenty of time nearly a decade to get get their stuff together get their get their together because yes one of world rugby's dreams is for a usa team that is very very good yeah and, and, and more this so usa team isn't it no i, I will m- say m- more is the be. point to a u.s market that's yeah. interested in the game yeah it's interesting apparently they're talking about potentially moving the world cup to the summer for 2031 if it comes around so it doesn't clash with the nfl yes yeah. um but yeah i mean i wouldn't necessarily be opposed with that to be honest with you um no. but uh, at the same time uh, yeah very 
very interesting to see how that goes. I mean, I'm excited. Uh, I hope they. I, I'm sure they'll do a decent job of it, and hopefully, it just captures the public interest over there. Well, that's it. Um, it's it's mission get America good again. Uh, like if, if interested, if Warren Gatlin can coach the team, and if he can find some players, if they can start playing some exciting ball, that'll get bums on seats. Because at the minute, they're playing turgid, the, ineffective. The, the, the MLR is the key to getting um, interest. Exactly. Getting, just public yeah, yeah. interest is the first thing. I think that's what most people want is just for it to 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 permeate the kind of the, the, the culture in America yeah, the sporting culture um, that is yeah yeah I yeah, know that's uh, so it's an interesting that, that is a very interesting announcement obviously very optimistic still it's still in, it's in the 2030s so it is kind of down the track but uh, they've they've set it in stone now so it'll be interesting to see how how all things transpire will the US be able to up their game enough will the MLR roll on and can continue to garner interest sufficiently such that well, I, I'm convinced they can host a World Cup even even next week, they, such as their infrastructure. But as you say, the interest, it's about fostering that interest in the game over in the States where it is up against some hefty competition for eyeballs. Yes. Um, um, uh, yeah, and then moving on, there's also just uh, this uh, perennial never will die uh, idea has reared its ugly head again. How often do I have uh, to hear a terrible idea? Um, <laughs> pretty often. Um, basically, they they uh, World Rugby held their held their critical talks in Dublin about this new global calendar and this new tournament, um, looking to for the most radical change to the structure of the sport since nineteen ninety five. Ugh, yes, basically why, making though? making all of Sanzar's dreams for their financial benefit come true to the benefit of absolutely no one else, all while covering it in the veil of supporting tier two nations which this absolutely doesn't do yeah so i did did like that's as damning as you can be about it but i i just think it's another poor idea anyway yeah and um, basically what they're looking to do is um had they have a working plan for a new two-tier competition for the top division to be founded in 2026 featuring 12 teams wrong again bob and yeah. um, they keep going with that one um England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, France and Italy of course and then South Africa, New Zealand, Australia Argentina, Fiji and Japan so six from the south, six from the north and no the Georgia south, as is the way Japan, of course, no Georgia is the way or, but but there would be an emer- uh, there would be um, a situation with the emerging uh, nations, they'd have a tier 2 competition which would also feature 12 teams um, the competition would be held in even years um, and uh, yeah, would basically avoid the Lions Tour and the uh, World Cup, which are obviously two big money makers yeah. for Sanzar. Um, and uh, so um, you'd have your big money makers, your Lions Tour, your World Cup for Sanzar, and then your big money uh, competition uh, on the alternate years. Um, each Northern Hemisphere team would play a Southern Hemisphere team uh, once, either home or away, to reduce travel time. The Southern Hemisphere nations would be divided into two blocks, with the lowest ranked team required to play their July tests on neutral territory, lowest ranked meaning Fiji, so the Tier 2 teams wouldn't get to host any games. Yeah. Um, so in the fir- they have an example here. In the first year, England, Wales and Ireland could go on a July tour and play tests in New Zealand, Australia and Japan, while Scotland, France and Italy would travel to South Africa and Argentina, with Fiji deciding in which of those countries they would like to stage their games. Very nice of uh, World Rugby to give Fiji the choice between Argentina and South Africa. <laughs> yes. Um, then, uh, yeah, the top two teams after those uh, six fixtures would meet in a grand final. Um, there'd also be drama of two relegation playoffs against leading teams from the second tier. Uh, the Emerging Nations League featuring Samoa, Tonga, USA, Canada, Uruguay, Chile, Namibia, Georgia, Romania, Spain, Portugal and the Netherlands um, is being referred to as the Challenger Division and would also involve games on neutral territory to limit travel costs. Yes. Um, this is Why do all of this though? This is unreal how bad all of this is, just how like ill thought out, just... Right. Like, wh- where is this game between the Netherlands and Chile being played to reduce travel? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Reduce um, travel by having it in, I don't know, Gdansk. Barbados. Barbados. Yeah, Why not? Well, well, who cares? Um, <laughs> that seems to be the attitude. Yeah. Anyway. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, um, the, the, the two biggest hurdles that they're talking about to this nonsense idea being ratified um, are, how, are the agreement over how to share the revenue. Needless to say, I mean, that's the whole reason for doing this yeah. silly idea. Um 
and uh, and the issues that they're going to have with the club sides, which are big, um, obviously insurmountable. Clubs, clubs I would are argue, oh, particularly knowing the French press. Yeah, well, clubs are and only required to release the tier players two players, players for three weeks in autumn this year, and they need to do a deal with Premiership Rugby and the LNR, which, which need to be very happen. lucrative for them. Um, but yeah, would, they'd have to screw. They're trying to screw the extra weekend in no in November, and they could end up losing one of the fallow weeks in the Six Nations, which is bad for player welfare. Um, one of the most disappointing things to come out of this was actually the International Rugby Players Group, um, who were not involved when the ideas were finalised, but they came out and basically said it was Conrad Smith who was representing them, uh, head of player welfare at the IRP, saying um, uh, they've uh, fought for a fair deal for emerging emerging nations to get regular game time. Like it's that is Scooby Scooby dubious to be honest with you because emerging nations are already getting decent game time yeah. and their players are getting time playing for clubs yes. le- learning how to play elite rugby which you're also just trying to take a, a dump on and it's it's also just like if you're a if you're like do Georgia count as an emerging nation because you're you're planning on cutting all of their games yeah. all of their games against tier one teams yeah Fiji Fiji thankfully they're on the right side of the bubble but Samoa and Tonga. No, yeah. screw you. You got to go through a whole season to play a promotion relegation playoff. Which if you lose, you there's there's no uh, there's no league next year. Yeah. So look forward to that. You're just going to create this chasm between tier one and tier two. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's an it's, absolutely it's farcically dumb idea. Indeed. Um, but also, like, it's also just a lie. Like that's the thing that really grates on me is that they try and do the shaming thing about how this is for emerging nations. This is not for emerging nations. Yeah. They put no thought into the challenger league to be played on neutral venue to save travel time. Yeah. Zero thought has gone into that. This is about <laughs> making money for the Sanzar unions that are a little bit paranoid about the lack of money especially with South Africa sniffing off up north they're yeah. wondering where their revenue generation comes from it's a constant existential worry in Australia and they're thinking hey maybe we just scrap the calendar that everyone else plays under and rewrite rugby in a way that gives us more money yes. like I just think it's absolutely daft I can't believe how far it's getting it it's, gets, just, it's gets an indication to this of podcast far too often world so world it does world they world keep releasing determined it determined to make I this am. happen it's, and like it just it depresses me I mean they're like, they might they, do it they might do it they're they're just, they might like, yeah. who, like who knows this yeah. could end up like it seems like they're getting more people on board every time yeah. and like it would be bad for all kinds of reasons it would be bad for tier 2 teams it would be bad for yeah. fans honest, it would devalue the, the world camera. Cup I don't extent. think there's enough time in the podcast to list all the ways yeah. that this is bad it's terrible. I just don't think there is you're it's, right like you're right it's absolute gibberish yeah. once again and we could use this window to propose our once again Autumn Nations Cup but sure, you've heard it all before you've heard it all before you can check they the won't previous listen. podcast they don't care they, like, they don't care they don't want the right solution they don't no. want the right solution for rugby and when they come at you with a blooming uh, press release talking about how this is for emerging nations oh. they're, they're lying to you and that just really sickens you it does anyway. it does rather but with that I suppose we will we will move on for uh, yeah no it is get, get late. That, that, that kind of stuff is just going to t- <laughs> trigger us now this, um, these days yeah no it's uh, here's a better better news a win for Zimbabwe's Go Shocks in the Curry Cup First Division how about that yeah, they won they won good. and that's great to see more beat Zimbabwe the, beat Boland they Silly did Boland of South Africa could not hack the, uh, the Zimbabwean uh, energy yeah and Pumped them by a point. Yeah, uh, great, 23 great 22. But yeah, another fantastic win is great to see. Speaking of emerging nations, the Rugby Africa Cup is going to be happening this this uh, summer. We're going to be That's watching right, that yes, with intrigue yeah. as well. Good to see these teams getting in the mix there. South Africa doing, doing a great job of actually being a, a big brother and a neighbour to a lot of these teams and giving good minutes and getting that Curry Cup, getting more teams involved as well. So good yeah. props to them. Absolutely. But, uh, um, yeah. Worth mentioning while we're on the subject of South Africa as well, um, just that um, there's that World Rugby, uh, in their continuing infinite wisdom, have come out with this law trial. Uh, they, well, I mean, they may as well have called it the anti razi law or the anti springbok yeah, law. the Razi law. Um, so basically, they, they have announced uh, the World Rugby Council has approved a global trial limiting the opportunity for non-playing personnel to enter the field of play during a match. Uh, operational for all competitions and standalone matches starting after July 1st of this year. Um, the, t- the trial aims to improve the flow of matches by reducing unnecessary stoppages without compromising welfare. Um, the trial <laughs> follows. Does that mean sexy physios are going to be banned from the side as well? Correct. Well, indeed. No. But well, what they're saying is that n- uh, water can only be brought onto the field, um, I think they were saying twice per half. So e- if there's an injury, the injured player can get water. But nobody else can get water on uh, only twice and a half. So if it goes over that, 
nobody else can get it, which to me is dubious. Like, that I, is. I, what about player welfare? No, well, indeed. Like, what, what if it's what if what if this is a match at altitude and played at you know thirty five degree heat in South Africa in Johannesburg? Like, you have to. For me, you have to give better leeway than that. And this is apparently going to be determined by the referee. They could have just been but very like, specific and it, said, Razi Erasmus is not allowed to come on with a water bottle <laughs> and give tips to the spring box while he's playing the Lions. I know. Yeah, um, exactly. They could have just phrased the <laughs> law that way. Because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, amusingly, they, they, they did specify, because no, it was previously no uh, head coach, but they have now changed the wording from no head coach or director of rugby. No, no. Which, yeah. of course, prompted Razi Erasmus to tweet, Oh, funnily enough, I was just chatting with my uh, my agent yesterday, and we, she she thought director of rugby has such a formal ring to it. We agreed that director of coaching would be a much better title for, for me. For me, yeah. so can't wait. The yeah. director of coaching is right there, pitch side with the boys. Just um, call him the director of hydration. Yeah, yeah, indeed, there you go. Um, yeah. Surely hydration directors are allowed to give water. Yeah, that's my that's job. all I am. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But um, I mean, I, the, 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 the feud that is ongoing yeah, between I mean, Razi and the world. It is amusing. Bodies, it's, it is it's amusing. amusing. I mean, they really um, are triggered by him. They, they really him. are. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, and he, I enjoy but his I response think, to that because he is a bit of a troll with it. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like, but world also, rugby it's, are it's so a bizarre worthy of trolling. Like, to be honest, yeah. which I understand. They, they already banned him from the game for two years. And now they're like, and no water either. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I understand. I sympathize with some of the frustrations. Some of those Springbok boys, like Etzebeth, do go down together a breather they but do. at the same time it is an, a test level it is an extraordinarily attritional game it is you cannot you cannot start limiting how often no. guys drink water indeed I just and it's not it, silly and like it wasn't an um, issue when for the Wallabies when they were cutting them apart and the thing like the, the response to it is on the team and it's on the team to up the yeah pace. there like, are ways if, to control yeah, the if, tempo if a team's yeah. going to try and slow the game down there's a ways there are ways to speed it up and that's just the dynamic in it I don't think this this Razzie Erasmus law is, is entirely necessary at all it, it is just reaction <laughs> It, and it's, it is amusing, It's just a though. cheap show. It's definitely amusing, no, no <laughs> doubt there. Um, yes, with that, we're going to move on. There's, uh, there was actually there was some tragic news as well, actually, over the weekend in France. Or like this a, is actually a, few a, couple weeks weeks old, ago, a couple of weeks yeah. old now, actually. But uh, former Waratahs squad member um, Kelly Miafua, um, he was in France over there. He was celebrating his uh, that there was a win, a victory for uh, over Narbonne, Narbonne with his teammates. Um, and he jumped into a bridge uh, or jumped off a bridge into a river um, and yeah well I don't we don't actually know what yeah. the circumstances of that were whether he jumped or whether he fell or what the story was but basically unfortunately just um, on, a, on, a, on a sort of bad, uh, ill-advised late night hijinks unfortunately he actually passed away yeah and Very uh, sad apparently us. Montauban uh, prop Christopher uh, Viatoa went to his aid and actually had to be rescued himself and uh, was taken to hospital with hypothermia yeah. um, so really sad basically fell into a, a river on a night out and, yeah. and uh, ended up passing away and apparently was just such a well liked guy yeah. and just a, all a the great team. ambassador for the game and yeah class class player as well so that yeah. was absolutely tragic news and I just thought worth mentioning and uh, RIP or IP to Kelly that's just horrific news yeah um, but we should finish on, on a more positive note and this is just a story from a few weeks back that oh, caught yes. my eye yeah um, it was at Heaton Moor or FC in, in England um, put together a field that they were playing a game I think it was their thirds or their seconds um, but they fielded an entire front row forward pack from the same nuclear family uh, which included a father and his seven sons. So Mike Ireland, of 56 uh, years of age, was starting tight head prop and captain, and the rest of the pack was uh, was being well, played as all of his sons, the youngest being 18. So the team sheet read, number one, Sam, Ar- Sam Ar- Ireland, two, Dan Ireland, three, Mike Ireland, captain, four, Joel Ireland, five, Matt Ireland, six, Luke Ireland, seven, Steve Ireland, and eight, Tommy Ireland. Come on, Ireland. I mean, <laughs> it's just, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. I mean, I don't know if that's ever happened se- before. Se- but seven sons and not one of them are back. And that's yeah, just, yeah, what a, what a, a, what a family. What, what a family. family. I mean, yeah. Tighthead Da is very proud. <laughs> yeah. Captain Tighthead yeah, was exactly. delighted with his no, meaty not one poxy winger. No, 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 no. Um, all forwards. <laughs> Yeah. That's just a great. Crack. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen a team sheet read quite so <laughs> no, quite so amazing. patriotically. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I'd, I'd be I'd be rooting for them. I definitely would. How could I not be rooting for yeah, them, for yeah. Team Ireland? Yeah. It's the Ireland pack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're very good. <laughs> yeah, so, so I just yeah. thought that was an amazing is, story. A fair play amazing. to Mike and family. Yeah, fair play, um, Mike. Fifty. What did you say? Fifty six. Yeah, 56. and still still. 
packing down the scrum, packing down the scrum. Love it, no love it. Another bother on him. He's a hard man. Don't spill his pint. Well, I tell you what, like you, you wouldn't want to get in the wrong side of that pack and get no, the seven like, brothers or seven sons after gorgeous. you. If you but uh, yeah, no, that was that was just a, a lighter note on which to end. But uh, with that, we are going to wrap up the podcast. That is all the news that uh, we had a, a fair bit in the interim because it has been a few weeks. We will probably be back in a, in a couple of weeks as well, a bit more sporadic, but we will be getting into our, our more regular routine once we get into that test footy window in uh, in summer and we'll be a bit more flat to flat. Yeah, yeah well, there's, there, there's some good footy coming up. There's obviously the Super Rugby knockouts. We have the Champions Cup final. We won't be back next week. I'm going to be off um, from sort of midweek into... Uh, into France, the south of France, on holiday. So wish me well yep. on that, and wish um, Leinster well in the comments down below. Yeah, on that. and we'll be back maybe possibly the week after with a review of those games, and I might even get a bit of footage. Hopefully, if I can get to the uh, if I can get to the Challenge Cup final, I might get a bit of footage from that. I don't think I'll be getting footage from the final itself because um, <laughs> I'll be I'll be busy supporting Leinster. This is a fan podcast. I'm a Leinster fan, and Indeed. I make no bones about it. We'll be yes. going there to, to cheer on the boys. Yeah, um, but at and the same then you'll time, with the recovery time for the voice before you broadcast after. After that one for as well. sure for <laughs> sure it's crazy and yeah, um, yeah so uh, uh, we'll be back either the week after the challenge the Champions Cup final or potentially the week after that uh, with a review of those games but also looking ahead to the URC knockouts and the Premiership knockouts and the uh, looking back on the on the uh, MLR and the and the SLAR and then before Super you know rugby. it's Super Rugby knockouts will be yeah. there and then, yeah, and then Summer the Series season. you know we, we're going to be facing the All Blacks in three tests and they just announced they're going to be playing the Maori in midweek as well so yeah, which yeah, means Ireland have to bring like 50 players yeah, by the way indeed. nobody can double up by playing the Maori and the All Blacks in midweek are no. you kidding me between All Blacks tests if one player doubles up that's mismanagement <laughs> that's probably because you can't do that it's probably impossible yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true it's like Ireland A will need to be travelling in, in in concert but yeah so like a lot of exciting rugby week to come we will be there to cover cover it we will be getting more routine as the summer comes on we're going to be banging out weekly ones but for now you should ring the bell so that you're notified when we upload because it will be a bit more sporadic if you do enjoy this line of uh, kind of long long form rugby chat about this game we love please do subscribe as well down below leave a comment with your thoughts any questions any queries any just comments in general drop them down below it does does well for the channel and we we do in, read them we do enjoy reading your opinions and takes on the rugby and um, yeah but with that without any more to say i think we're going to sign off on this episode one two four and we will see you in the next one bye bye guys